I'm a, I'm a threat to the official narrative. Yeah. And 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 uh, what archaeologists have tried to do in in calling me dangerous and saying that I'm a threat to the official narrative is saying, goodness knows what's going to happen next if people start questioning us. You're that dangerous, Graham. Yeah, apparently mm -hmm. that day. My <laughs> wife, Santa, and I have climbed the Great Pyramid five times. We, why? Why? Why did you want to climb the pyramid? I think it is there to pose a huge question about our past. I think the pyramid was designed to make people think. And it was created by people who thought. I think there was a lost civilization of the Ice Age. I think there were survivors. I think they did attempt to reinitiate civilization, but they weren't quite able to do so. They created, uh, if you like, secret societies all around the world, which persisted for thousands of years, initiates to whom knowledge was passed down, waiting for the right moment to switch civilization back on again. People need to think for themselves, and in order, in, we're, we're intelligent creatures, that's the, the, the essence of being human. Graham Hancock is an author and a journalist who really wonders about our past, where we're from, and the mysteries of the ancient civilizations. He really dived deep into these questions in his books, and most recently in a series on Netflix called Ancient Apocalypse. His books sold millions of copies and were translated in 27 languages, and I had the pleasure to talk to him for two hours, so enjoy. You've drunk ayahuasca yourself. Yes, and yeah. we're preparing. In one week, we have another. Yeah. I was very happy with the session I had in yeah. <coughs> in Peru just now. Firstly, because it was with the shaman who I first we first drank with uh, 20 years ago. Um, and, and so Santa, you do it. We know. always do it together. Oh, that's and, cute. And we're we're upwards of sort of 75 sessions now. Wow. Um, but this one, I I focused my intention very much on a problem I have with migraines, mm -hmm. which uh, is ruining my life, actually. That bad? It's that bad. Very, every day, strong pharmaceutical meds. This time, just to keep me functional, since that session, I've only had one migraine, and that was 10 days ago. So I'm feeling... There is an improvement The already. massive improvement. Do you think you went to the core? Um, I, I think so. I, wow. I, I, I'm, I'm, not sh I, I'm, not, I'm not sure why or how it happened, but uh, I, I kind of trust Mother Ayahuasca. Yeah, <laughs> everybody calls her like that. That's interesting how it feels like a person when you encounter. It does. There's a, there's a presence. There's an intelligence. There's, a, there's an there's entity an, there. Yeah, there's like a consciousness. Yeah. yeah. There's, a few, there's a few tribes in the Amazon who regard the spirit of Ayahuasca as male. Really? Oh, yeah. Huh, um, interesting. It feels be, very much feminine to me. Almost everybody in the West yeah. encounters a feminine presence, and many yeah. in the Amazon do too, but, uh -huh. but, but there are a few. Who, so uh, when, you, when you say you did it 75 times, uh, was it always in the Peru or did no. you...? Um, we've, drunk, uh, we've drunk in London, uh, but... Not supposed to say it because it's, it's illegal? No, <laughs> it's, I, I don't mind saying that. It's just, it's just that... The sessions tend to be bad, badly organized by people who don't really know what they're doing. Oh, okay. And they don't understand we're dealing with a very powerful medicine here. They're not shaman? <sighs> no. so-called shaman? No. Okay. Uh, shamanism is a, is, is, is a long process. Right. It's not something you, it's not something you pick up uh, yeah. you know, when you used to be a drug dealer. And now you're finding <laughs> it. it's, some, it's something you work at for a, for a very long time. We've yeah. drunk quite frequently in Brazil. Okay. Um, and uh, in America, too. Nice. Yeah, yeah. What was your, like, your best experience? If I guess every every experience is very different, but did you did you have like one uh, because of the place you were, or that felt more compelling? To no. You? Um, the, the 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 most important thing for me, which I'm still working on, is is uh, revealing my own baggage. Mm -hmm. uh, and revealing my own baggage, yeah. the stuff I need to deal with. Mm -hmm. Uh, for example, the tendency to swift and unreasonable anger, uh, which can cause pain to others. Mm. Uh, I've been shown that. I've been shown the pain my mm. words cause. Mm. Uh, and uh, it's not a magic cure, but mm. it's made me think about it and, and think twice before I... Do you, do you complete it with psychotherapy? Do you, do you feel like it's incomplete in itself? I feel it's complete in itself. Yeah. yeah. And and I and I still feel I have I have more work to do with, with ayahuasca. It's never ending, is it? But I'm not 
I'm not in a hurry mm -hmm. anymore to have more sessions. If the time is right, the place is right, right. feels good, I will, I will do it. So you were in a, in a hurry for a moment well, in your life? Because it started out as a research project. As a what? As a research project. Mm -hmm. I hadn't, mm -hmm. um, apart from, I mean, we can do this on camera if you want. I like, think it's already started. Oh, good. <laughs> I, what, what happened was that um, I, I published a book in 2005 called Supernatural, mm -hmm. Meetings with the Ancient Teachers of Mankind. Yeah. It's recently been reissued in the US under the title visionary with um with a little bit of new information at the front and the back but basically it's the same book and that was the fundamental mystery there was why why is cave art and rock art all around the world so similar why 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 are the same kind of entities depicted why do we mm -hmm. see the same geometric patterns and uh, i became aware of a, a theory by a professor um, of anthropology actually in South Africa called David Lewis Williams. He calls it the neuropsychological theory of cave art. And he's arguing that, that really these similarities can be explained because all cave art, all ancient cave art at any rate, is shamanistic art. Mm -hmm. uh, shamans are depicting what they see in their visions and those visions are brought on in altered states of consciousness. Mm -hmm. um, at that point, I hadn't had a lot of experience in altered states of consciousness. Many years before, I'd had one very powerful LSD trip. Okay. But I hadn't, I hadn't gone back to it. But I, my view as a researcher is if I'm going to write about something, I have to immerse myself in it. And then I discovered that in the Amazon, <clears throat> shamans in the Amazon were painting their visions. They would, they would drink ayahuasca. They would return to the normal everyday state of consciousness. They would remember their visions, mm -hmm. and then they would paint them. And lo and behold, those paintings had uh, astonishing similarities with cave art from 35,000 years like ago from Pe Peshmer or Chauvet. Not only that, but the, 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 characteristic, the characteristic feature are therianthropes, and that is from the Greek therion, which means wild beast, and anthropos, which means man. Mm. Creatures that are hybrid, mm -hmm. that are part human, part animal in form. Okay. Uh, you find these uh, all over the ancient cave art. You find it in, in, in Chauvet, you find it in Peshmerl, and mm. you find it in the Amazon today. Interesting. Uh, and that would suggest that um, the painters are seeing the same things. Wow, that's fascinating. And, and therefore, I, therefore, I felt if I was to write this book authentically, that I needed to go to the Amazon and drink ayahuasca. Mm -hmm. And uh, we, my wife Santa and I went down to Peru and we had 11 sessions of ayahuasca there. In a row? Uh, yeah, in a row, but in, 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 <laughs> over a period of about three weeks. Wow, that's <laughs> intense. Did you, oh my God, the first <clears throat> time I did ayahuasca, I swear to myself, I swore to myself the whole time, never again, yeah. never again. And a lot of people I, I was with were doing it this, the, the next night. Yeah. And I felt sorry for them. Like, yeah. <laughs> so I wouldn't imagine. It's like... such a powerful and such an overwhelming experience. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> At the same time, it's a very interesting experience. Uh -huh. um, and uh, I wanted to get to grips with this visionary state. Mm. Uh, and and uh, it helped me very much to, to write my book. Mm -hmm. uh, I, in fact, if I hadn't had those experiences, I couldn't couldn't have written that book authentically of at any course. rate. It would have yeah. just been a piece of armchair theorizing rather than something based on direct experience. Yeah. Uh, and and um, yes, it is, it is physically hard work. There is the vomiting, there is the diarrhea. Yeah. Um, and uh, it's also psychically hard work. Mm -hmm. You can... Mm -hmm. You can be attacked in ayahuasca sessions. Mm -hmm. There is, or afterwards, or afterwards. Stay, uh, there, there's, there's, a, there's this powerful psychic element to it, and I, the way I look at it is that there is, there is good and evil in this world, mm -hmm. and and in the realms we enter in the ayahuasca state, there is also good and evil, and mm -hmm. and there, you know shamans in the Amazon and, and elsewhere are not necessarily, you know, models of goodness and kindness. They're, mm -hmm. they're often people who fight each other. They, they fight on the psychic plane. Uh, really? there's, a, there's a lot of jealousy and envy. There's a lot of ego going. Yeah, and, and that, and wow. that too. Um, so, they're so. They're humans after all. Yes, they're humans after all. And, and, and what, what I think happens with ayahuasca is that your barriers get lowered. Mm. 
the, the protections that you put around yourself get lowered and you become open to mm -hmm. things that you were not open to before. Mm -hmm. um, but, but by and large, uh, it's, a, it's a positive experience. And what mm -hmm. a good shaman will do if there is a, if there is a psychic attack underway, we'll, we'll deal with that. We'll handle so that. he will notice if there yes. is a psychic attack yeah, going yeah, on. So for yeah. those who are that, not... That's why, that's why sessions in the West where you have 100 people who are being managed who are being managed by three or four other people yeah, that, often that was... go very badly wrong you know because there's not the control and the care yeah there's too many people way too many people so how many people were there when you were doing your sessions in uh peru well or... when we first started in peru it was just santa and myself and a shaman um, wow well, it just... must be so different yeah it's very it's very different and then later sessions in brazil maximum of 12 people oh, um that's nice the only the the only curious curious one was the Unia de Vegetal in Brazil, which is a which is an ayahuasca church. Oh wow! I okay. mean, first of all, kudos to Brazil and to Peru for recognizing ayahuasca as a national heritage. Nice. And for I didn't and know for that. protecting its use under laws of religious freedom. There's no question of ayahuasca being illegal in these countries. No. Mm -hmm. uh, and there uh, and there have developed ayahuasca churches which have a kind of Christian element sometimes or an animistic element. The Unia de Vegetal is one of those and they handle an ayahuasca session very differently from anybody else we've ever drunk with. Uh, for, Why is it different? Well, first of all, first of all a large group will come into a a church-like building, uh, they will first, before the session, they'll sit down and have pizzas, <laughs> which, which I couldn't, yes. That is so weird. They serve pizza. And they throw it up after? Yeah. Oh yeah, my yeah. God. Okay. And, that's And, and, and it's different. a rather thin tr uh, tea. It's not a very, the very thick brew that you can sometimes get. Oh, okay. And then you sit, you drink the brew and you sit in a chair, like in the congregation, and then various people stand up and give addresses and talk about things that are on their mind. Mm -hmm. um, and the lights are on, and it's just it's just very different from other sessions that I've done. Oh my I, gosh! I didn't love it. I, no, I, I guess I, it's pretty I prefer weird. I prefer to be flat mm -hmm. uh, on on something reasonably something darker too. I guess I, I don't like bright light. I, mm -hmm. I'd like to be I'd like to be in a, a, a darkened space. Mm -hmm. Uh, where I can I can focus. You can see from from here, I guess, in a better way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and and it's it's often the case. It, it's I think it's partly dependent on dose, but it's often it's right. often the case that you can uh, you can if an ayahuasca vision is particularly terrifying or disturbing, you can often stop it by opening your eyes. But mm. but if the if the dose is enough, uh, and that was the case in my most recent <laughs> ayahuasca session in prison. So you open your it eyes. It doesn't matter whether there. you open your eyes yeah, or not. You don't it's know. still oh. it's still there. Uh, you... and, and I was dealing with two horizons on the ground. I could see the physical ground in this realm, but there was another ground covered with plants all, all above so it. So it was a big dose that you. It got. was a hefty dose, and it made and it made maneuvering a little bit complicated. Uh -huh. like, like if I needed to walk to the toilet or anything, you know yeah. what is the. Yeah. What is this? You're crawling there. Yeah, um, <laughs> but but uh, you know we're we're in the sessions to have to have this experience and to see. I, I do regard ayahuasca as a as a teacher, mm -hmm. and that's that's primarily what it's about. It's a, it's an enormous mystery. It is. What is going on here when we drink this brew? Is mm -hmm. it is it just our brains on drugs? A lot of people mm -hmm. will say that. A lot of scientists will say that. Yeah. Um, I don't think anybody's got the answer. My my view is that that we are altering the receiver wavelength of the brain. Mm. Uh, that reality is much more complicated and much vaster and stranger than we imagine in this limited frame. Three D, yeah. To which we confine ourselves, yeah. uh, and that it allows us access to other to other levels of freestanding reality. Mm -hmm. I, I, I'm often regarded as completely nuts for saying that, but the people who regard that as nuts have never drunk ayahuasca themselves. Uh, and and uh, en entry into, I think to put it in scientific terms, for me, it's, a, it's, it's like encountering a parallel dimension. Right. That's, I've been shut it off really from. It really feels like that. Yeah. And, yeah. And, 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 and that dimension has its own reality. Now, <laughs> When we define reality in our society today, if, if 20 or 30 people all say that something is real, we tend to say, okay, it's real. Yeah. Uh, and, and this is the case with ayahuasca, that huge numbers of people have, the, have very similar kinds of encounters, and, and particularly this entity that so many of us call Mother Ayahuasca, this feminine presence who is a, who, who is a teacher mm -hmm. uh, and whose practice is tough love <laughs> yeah very tough love <laughs> yeah i didn't experience the, like anything but tough love with ayahuasca so i'm hoping that my next journey would will be uh, easier um 
the next the first time i it was really really hard and but the thing is that because people ask me after why do you what did you go back like wh mm -hmm. what are you seeking and i was like the way i felt afterwards not while I was on ayahuasca, but I remember feeling so light, so relieved from like a very heavy baggage I was mm -hmm. carrying. And I knew I, I was through with it. Like what I had dealt with during the ayahuasca, I knew I was done with. Yeah. And I did, uh, I believe in psychotherapy. I studied psychotherapy, but I feel like it's like a shortcut. Like it's, mm. it's very intense and you just dive and you, you have to surrender you to. have to surrender. There's no point in trying to fight it. No, if you do, I think you're just going to regret very I can, badly. I compare, it, I, I compare it in that sense to the ocean. My wife, Santa, and I have done a lot of scuba diving. Yeah, years of it. Too. And we, we, we realized pretty soon that you, need you to don't go with disagree the with the ocean. Oh, no. You, you go with the ocean. Yeah, you, you don't try and the fight current. the ocean. Yeah. And I think it's the same with ayahuasca. Yeah, it's a very yeah. bad experience if you go against the current. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, well, I was... Thinking about that, because you openly talk about your ayahuasca experience, um, and we know you as someone who's, go, who's going um, against the official narrative about our history, about mm -hmm. our uh, <clears throat> ancient, ancient culture. And as you know, I'm fascinated with uh, pyramids, with mm -hmm. ancient Egypt. Ever since <clears throat> I was a kid, I've been fascinated with Atlantis and that's why I really enjoy reading your books and I, I enjoy your show and thank you I follow what you're doing because I'm interested in mm -hmm. those things and I don't think I'm the only one I I had Oliver Stone on my podcast and he was telling me he considered himself a truth seeker mm -hmm. he hates the word conspiracy theorist mm -hmm. and I consider myself a truth seeker and I think that's what you are as well I, I hope so yeah you seem to be searching for the truth and I think there's some common ground with the ayahuasca or any searching for the inner truth yeah. and searching for the truth out there in the world yes. is somehow connected do yes. you do you think it's I, the same I, motivation I, for I, you I, I do think so it's especially when there are so many forces at work in our society which are a, a, attempting to create a dominant narrative uh, which are attempting to define how people should think mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and I think it's I think it's important to have some alternative to that I think it's it's important to challenge that uh, because because Absolutely. where societies fall into a single-minded way of thinking which is controlled through it's a hierarchy tyranny. It's, yeah. it's, it, it can be dreadful. The, the consequences can be absolutely awful. Well, I feel like we've tapped into it during the pandemic. Yeah. I, I, I was ta telling you just before we started, but in Quebec, it was, it was three very long years. Mm. Um, and I... I I feel like since the very beginning of the pandemic, I was in the outsider camp. Mm -hmm, like I mm -hmm. didn't really buy it. I felt like they were selling so much fear. Mm. And, and to me, fear is not, uh, it, it can be the place where you take the good decision. Yeah. So I was like, can we just calm down? Yeah. But it, it was never an option, no. calming down. And now it's just like, it feels like we're rolling onto this wave of, you know, instilling a lot of fear and anger and hate and division mm. and, uh, and using it as a tool to create obedience exactly you know if you want it if you want an obedient population you have to persuade them that it's their own in, in their own interests mm -hmm. to be obedient and that mm -hmm. that's the way that the the whole covid issue has been has been used yeah uh, as, I, as i said before we started talking i i don't have any evidence that persuades me that that covid was artificially or deliberately released perhaps mm -hmm. it was perhaps it wasn't but mm -hmm. i do have definite evidence that the powers that be the governments throughout the world used covid used the opportunity of covid to inculcate a habit of obedience in the population yeah. and to make the population feel uh, that that was in their own interests mm -hmm. there were all sorts of things in britain we had people standing outside their their houses every thursday night at 5 p.m. and and clapping the national health service for all the wonderful work oh. they were doing you know <laughs> wow. this is this is this is a a step towards tyranny once we once we start doing this people mm -hmm. need People need to think for themselves, and mm -hmm. in order, in, we're, we're intelligent creatures. That's the the, the essence of being human. Yeah, and yeah. and and if we're to think for ourselves, then we we don't just need one narrative. We need multiple narratives, and we need the controlling dominant narrative to be challenged mm -hmm. again and again and again. And that's what you're doing so well. <laughs> I hope so. I hope so. I mean, my particular focus has been has been on ancient history, yeah. uh, but but also on 
on the nature of reality. You know, exactly. what is what is this thing that we call real? So before um, you were, um, you've been a journalist before you started writing I books was, yeah. Uh, yeah. for mainstream media. Um, yeah. So you wrote for the Guardian, I think. I did. You, I did. I I started my. I started my sort of working life um, at the age of. After I left university at the age of 23, and that was in that was in 1973. Uh, and uh, in 1975, I traveled to Somalia with my first wife, and I lived in Somalia for a year. Uh, my first wife was from Somalia. She I, I met her in England, but we, we we traveled to Somalia and spent a year there. Uh, and I kind of had the opportunity to immerse myself in Somali culture. Somalia in 1975 was not what it is today. Was it better? It was far better. Okay. It, was, it was a very open, free society. Oh, wow. okay. uh, there was a dictatorship, but, mm -hmm. but the dictatorship was very limited in its outreach. Okay. Basically, as long as you didn't get in the face of the dictator, you could do whatever you wanted. Okay. Uh, and, and I found, <laughs> it's bizarre and contradictory to say so, but I found it, I found it extremely free. <laughs> I had a wonderful time there. Nice. And I um, and, uh, immersed myself in that culture and began to submit freelance articles from Somalia to various, various newspapers and magazines. Um, and and uh, when I came back to England, I, I got a job on a magazine. Uh, which was called New Internationalist, and it was it was a magazine that uh, took a radical stance on the whole issue of foreign aid and development. Um, it was an it was an interesting thing for me. Um, it gave me insight into how magazines are made, into mm -hmm. the whole production process. It involved a lot of travel, uh, and all the time I was freelancing as well. So even though I was I was working for New Internationalist. Well, actually, I told them I was taking a holiday. I was going away for two weeks, but I got a deal with the London Sunday Times okay. to go and report the war between Somalia and Ethiopia, wow. the, the Ogaden War in 1977. Mm. And I didn't come back in two weeks. It took me about a month to get to get through that. And I had, a, had an amazing experience, published a number of reports in the Sunday Times. And I gradually built up a bit of credibility right. as, a, as, as a correspondent. And eventually in 1980... Maybe, maybe maybe early eighty one, uh, the Economist uh, appointed me as their East Africa correspondent based in Nairobi in Kenya. Wow! And I do always point out that that may sound very grand, but it wasn't. <laughs> no. I was a stringer. I was paid fifty British pounds a month as a retainer, Ouch. and anything I earned would be based on the number of words I wrote. Oh. Uh, and typically, an Economist story is three hundred words. So I, I That's wasn't. not a lot. I wasn't making a lot of money, but but I but it opened doors. Yeah, and, I, and you I were traveled. building your reputation. I was building my reputation, and I traveled very widely around mm -hmm. East Africa, and I became particularly a specialist on Ethiopia and on Somalia. Oh, wow. Uh, and I, I regarded myself as very much as a current affairs journalist. So um, I find it kind of interesting because you started pretty mainstream uh, and then you started tapping into subjects that are going, that, that are shaking maybe a little yeah. bit the, the official narrative. Well, the first, the first time that really, that really happened. Uh, the sign and the seal? Well, no, uh, it, it, it was actually still much, very much on current affairs. Uh, and it was a book that I published in 1989 called Lords of Poverty. Okay. Uh, the freewheeling lifestyles, power, prestige and corruption of the multi-billion dollar aid business. Mm. My travels had, uh, had shown me that aid is not help, uh, that aid um, empowers those who are already in power and very rarely reaches the poor who actually need it, mm. uh, that it's funneled through huge bureaucracies, Uh, and that it is uh, that it is almost useless in everything that it does. So there, I found myself being a contrarian yeah. because at that time, criticizing aid was like criticizing motherhood. You know, you, yeah, you, it's something you weren't supposed to do. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. I published a very critical book about foreign aid. How was it received? Surprisingly well, actually. I think it was dawning, beginning to dawn on a lot of people at that time mm. that, uh, that, that the way aid was structured was not necessarily helpful at so all. So it was a claim even in the mainstream media? Yeah, it was. And perhaps that, perhaps that was because it partly fitted some mainstream agenda at that time. I'm not, I'm not sure. It was, it, was, it was a claim. <laughs> in the mainstream media. But I, I was just telling my truth. I was just telling what right. I saw. Yeah. And, and I was looking at the statistics. And I did a lot of research for that book and, and, and you know, visited many areas that were receiving aid and saw how mm. how useless it was actually mm -hmm. in, in in helping people um, well that I, was important perhaps, perhaps the reason perhaps the reason the mainstream 
didn't dislike it was was because you know I made the point that um, no none of the rich countries in the world today got rich because they got aid. Mm, uh, maybe that, that fitted into a mainstream narrative. I'm not sure. <laughs> maybe <laughs> you didn't do it on purpose, but that no, worked out. That, that's 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 how that's how it was. And, yeah. uh, but my view was very contrary to the to the general mm-hmm. mainstream view at that time. Yeah. Round about then and through the 1980s, I had stumbled across the Ethiopian claim to possess the Ark of the Covenant. Yeah. A very different type of story. Yeah. And uh, that that story intrigued me. Mm-hmm. Once, once I got to grips with it and realized that there was substance to it, uh, although all academics were claiming that it was complete nonsense, mm-hmm. I don't course. see how an entire culture can be just dismissed as complete nonsense. Um, so the the entire culture would be the Ethiopian culture. Yes, the mm-hmm. Ethiopian culture, but both Ethiopian Christians and Ethiopian Jews. We have to remember that there is a that there is a, a, an indigenous Jewish population in Ethiopia, the origins of which are extremely ancient. Mm. They're called the Falashas. They call themselves the Beta Israel, uh, and they have their own story about the Ark of the Covenant. And I I, I investigated this whole matter in, in in great depth, and eventually ended up writing a book called The Sign and the Seal: A Quest for the Lost. Ark of the Covenant, and that actually didn't annoy many people yeah, either. That, exactly. But you know, I wasn't. I wasn't really. I was saying, look, I think the academics are wrong to mm. dismiss this as pure fantasy and mm-hmm. folklore. There has to be some substance to it. But there was room, maybe, to critique back then. That is no longer here. I'm. I'm not sure. It wasn't. No? What I, what I wasn't doing is in that book is saying that the whole structure of history, as it is given to us by the mainstream, is based on false foundations, and that's what I came to next with Fingerprints of the Gods that I yeah. published in 1995. Yeah, you were all in with this one. Yeah, that 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 that, uh, that the house of history, as I call it, was built on very flimsy foundations. Well, I think that's the core of your work. You you demonstrate in a very simple way that what we're being told. Lies on nothing. Lies on nothing. The generally speaking, where where history is based on solid documentation, we can be reasonably confident. Reasonably, not mm-hmm. totally, but mm-hmm. we can be reasonably confident that uh, that it's okay. Mm-hmm. But when you get into prehistory, when you get into the time before documents have survived, mm-hmm. uh, it becomes it becomes much more difficult. For example, we have the Indus Valley civilization in India. Uh, it had a written script but it's been impossible to decipher it. Nobody can Why? translate that script. We don't have the code to... No, we don't have the code. And, uh, unlike ancient Egypt, where we had the Rosetta Stone mm-hmm. and it was possible to translate Egyptian hieroglyphs. Yeah. In, the, in the case of the Indus Valley script, nobody has ever succeeded in translating it. Mm. So there's a whole story about ancient Egypt, uh, ancient India, which which is in written documents which go back 5,000 years or more, but we which nobody can, read ca- it. which nobody can ah, read. That is so um, sad. And, 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 and then you're left what? You're left with archaeology, mm. uh, which primarily bases itself on whatever small amounts of material they can dig out of the ground in whatever small areas of the world they happen to look at. Mm-hmm. And suddenly we're dealing with something very flimsy rather than something very strongly. An archaeologist yeah. may say, we've got history nailed, we understand prehistory, we understand everything. They often do say that, but Are they, they don't. saying that? Well, they certainly are. Okay, cause in my case, the, 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 the critiques of my work by yeah. archaeologists, I'm, I'm suggesting, and I emphasize, I'm suggesting, I'm not insisting, yeah. I'm suggesting that there's a forgotten episode in human history. Yeah, yeah. I'm suggesting that, uh, put it in plain language, that there's been a lost civilization. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, even a, the notion of a lost civilization should not be too surprising to archaeology, because to go back to the Indus Valley civilization, which is now recognized as a civilization, nobody knew that such a thing existed until the 1920s, mm-hmm. when some accidental discoveries in, in what is now Pakistan made it clear that there had been a huge civilization there. So that was a lost civilization that was found. Mm-hmm. I think uh, I think we're dealing with um, something very different during the Ice Age, to what is presented to us by by mainstream archaeology. And mm-hmm. a lot of my work over the last 30 years has been focused on trying to make that case. Yeah. That we've that we've lost an important part of the story. I, I, I use the phrase that we're a species with amnesia. Yeah. Uh, and, and that's not entirely original to me. Uh, Velikovsky wrote a book called Mankind in Amnesia. Uh, mm-hmm. And really, I just developed that idea, that right. idea further. That there's there's a sort of black hole in our past, upon which archaeology has imposed a narrative, right. and that narrative is that our ancestors were not stupid, but 
simple, simple. hunter gatherers mm-hmm. with a with a with a non complex society mm-hmm. and with relatively limited knowledge of right. the state of the world in which they in which they live. I found a lot of evidence which suggests that 10,000, 12,000, 15,000, 20,000 years ago, maybe 30 or 40,000 years ago, there were cultures that had knowledge of complex astronomical phenomena, yeah. cultures that had knowledge of the size and dimensions of our planet, uh, who, who uh, knew the polar radius of the Earth and the equatorial like circumference. The Great Pyramid, of, right. and, and manifested it in the, in the Great Pyramid mm-hmm. on a scale of 1 to 43,200. So impressive. And, and, and the, the official uh, narrative would say that this is just random. Yes, a coincidence. They, just 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 random, just a coincidence, uh, okay. uh, and and something to be ignored, uh, because because archaeologists are so sure uh, that they've got prehistory right. Whereas I would say archaeologists have got a lot of prehistory right, but they've also got some very fundamental factors about prehistory wrong, uh, in 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 my opinion, um, and and therefore it was interesting to me. I've I've been under attack by the archaeological community and by their friends in the media uh, really since I published Fingerprints of the Gods. Oh, okay, that's when it started? It really started then, right from the, right from the beginning. But it was a bestseller at the same time. You... It was a bestseller, and that was, and that was why I was under attack. You see, if, the book, yeah. if my books weren't bestsellers, yeah, no one uh, would bother. very few people read them, why should archaeologists bother with me? Yeah. I was challenging their narrative. You and... were, because you say <laughs> archaeologists um, attack me, but you were also challenging them in a way that probably forced an answer or something well a they, they they felt they had to respond yeah. because i was because i was getting some public acceptance of, exactly. of what i was saying yeah. and this is this is something that needs to be understood is that there is a there is a dominant narrative about the human past uh, and in that sense it's not so different from the control that is exercised by governments or, or large corporations mm-hmm. on the way we think control is exercised on the way we think about our past Archaeologists get very angry with me because because they say I have a large platform. Right. My books have been read by millions. Yeah, that's I, one of the things I read of it. They they are criticizing you for having a large audience, and yeah. when they publish a paper in a scientific review, no one really nobody 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 reads, nobody it. reads it exactly. So it, cre- it creates a lot of envy and and mm-hmm. um, uh, a lot of jealousy, as as a, as a matter of fact. Why do How, you what do you answer to th- to those who say that you don't have to be peer reviewed because you're not a scientific? Well, who are my peers? Uh, I mean, will will I be reviewed by yeah. other journalists? Well, I do mean, you, I, do I don't work... claim to be a scientist. Another I don't thing, I don't claim yeah. to be an archaeologist. I don't claim yeah. to be an academic. Mm-hmm. Uh, I what I what I claim to be is fundamentally a journalist, mm-hmm. uh, but uh, an advocate. I'm, I, and perhaps that's where I vary from. From, well, that you could you could say that's where I vary from most journalism. But actually, if you get to grips with a lot of journalism, it is also advocacy. Journalism, journalists mm-hmm. do advocate particular oh, yeah. causes or particular points of view. And the yeah. the point of view that I'm advocating uh, is that we need to take another look at prehistory uh, and much more careful look. And and the fact that I have a large platform, the the Netflix show Ancient Apocalypse, obviously was seen by tens of millions of people it was or, number one for several years in it was, many it, was countries. it was a, it was a huge uh, probably one of the most successful documentary series that netflix has has ever made and, and, and this in thank you this infuriated archaeologists <laughs> because here's hancock who they disliked anyway yeah. who now has this massive worldwide platform mm-hmm. but uh the point the point i'd like to make to that is that <clears throat> that actually archaeology has a massive worldwide platform too mm-hmm Yes, individual papers written by individual archaeologists may be read by a few dozen people, <laughs> uh, but it goes deeper than that. Everything we learn about prehistory from the moment we start going to school is based on what I call mainstream archaeology. <clears throat> There's no alternative point of view in there. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. If you read books about ancient Egypt that are aimed at children, they're all based on yeah, what archaeology has decided yeah. was the case. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that continues all the way through the education system, continues through high school, continues through university. Yeah. Most journalists, if they ever bother to investigate the past at all, will talk to archaeologists and will report the points of view of, of archaeologists. Yeah. So actually, it is a dominant narrative. And right. no matter how large my platform may be, it does not compete with the size of the platform 
that archaeology has yeah. in, in imposing a particular Creating narrative. Creating the official narrative, basically. Creating the yeah. official narrative, mm-hmm. which is often accepted without question as being true, because after all, these are archaeologists, they're good people, they've devoted their whole career to it, they're specialists. Well, that's the we thing. With I'm, I'm trying to figure <clears throat> out, because I, I really try to understand the other people's point of, view, point of view, and I'm thinking, if I'm studying to be an archaeologist, that's because I have a passion for archaeology, mm. I'm curious, I really want to understand the past. So when I'm faced with the facts that you are presenting in your books or on, on Netflix, you know, like to me, I went to Egypt with my husband. I, I love Egypt. Um, mm. And I was in the Great Pyramid. I, I was thinking there's no way it was. I don't think there was ever a dead body in this pyramid. Like it doesn't feel like that. There's I know absolutely it, no evidence. It's based that there on ever nothing, was. but there's no inscriptions on the wall. Yeah. Um, you know, when you go in the Valley of the Kings, it's all over the place, the mm. hieroglyphs and, and you can feel it's just like it has a it comes from, from a different mm. era completely. It, yeah. But but mainstream archaeologists will tell you it was a tomb. And only a tomb? It has to be a tomb. And for a specific pharaoh at a specific time. And you don't find his name nowhere. And, you know, there are so many things when you start digging that makes no sense. And that's where I get mad personally, because Mm. I feel this is my past too. I'm a human. And and I want to remember where I'm from. I really feel when you say species with amnesia, I, I really feel like it's like I'm scratching my head trying to remember. Like I know there is something yes. missing. I feel there is something missing ever since I was a child. Yeah. And 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 I feel like someone, I don't know, or a group of people are depriving me from yes. I, knowing I, my past. I and that's that so too. frustrating. And I, I hope that that's where where my books and presentations have been have been useful. Mm-hmm. Is that they've helped people to gather the courage to slip out from under the dead hand of archaeology yeah. and think for themselves mm-hmm. about the about the material. Well, I guess I most do people don't rega- even know like the things you're presenting most people don't know that, you know, the the, the Cheops is not even named in in the pyramid or m- most people don't know that. Yeah. So when you say that and then I'm like, why do they all agree on an official story if it's based on when? Like that that's where I'm just I can't understand i'd like to speak with an egyptologist to try to really understand their mindset because i don't really get it i think i think the problem is um that archaeology is a profession like any other profession Mm -hmm. and uh, it has established certain guidelines and rules about about how people should think i i don't think it's a conspiracy Mm -hmm. i don't think archaeologists are putting their heads together to deceive the public about the past i think it's just it's just the way that professional organizations work. If mm-hmm. you, once a once a dominant narrative has been achieved, if you don't, if you don't accept that dominant narrative, if you start to you're fight an against outsider it, and then, then it's you become hard. an outsider, and you're unlikely to have a very successful career. Yeah. Um, there, there was a case of of, of an, uh, an American archaeologist who uh, has very interesting findings on the peopling of the Americas and on the ancient peopling of the Americas. Um, and he was told if he did an interview with me, he, 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 he's, he would no longer have any association with his university. You're that dangerous, Graham? Yeah, apparently, mm-hmm. that, da- apparently that dangerous. <laughs> wow. And, and the, reaction, the reaction to my Netflix series from archaeology was, was literally to say, in print, we know there was no lost civilization. We oh, okay. know there was no civilization during the Ice Age. How arrogant. It's incredibly arrogant. And how can they possibly know that? Mm -hmm. Uh, Science doesn't know. That may be their opinion. Yeah, that's an opinion. And they're welcome to it. But they don't know that. No, they were not there. And I think it's important to be clear here that there are huge areas of the world that have never been studied by archaeology at all. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, and the areas that I point to... Underwater? Yeah, most, pr- most prominently, <laughs> yeah. Are, are the 27 million square kilometers of land that were submerged by rising sea levels at the end of the last ice age. Mm-hmm. 120 meter rise in sea level at the end of the last ice age. That submerged 27 million square kilometers of the best real estate on Earth that was above water during the ice age and is underwater now. And relatively little work has been done in marine archaeology. And when it is done, it tends to be focused more on material from the historical era, like shipwrecks, for example. Mm -hmm. These get a lot of attention from from marine archaeology. Uh, Then you have another enormous black hole is the Sahara Desert. 
So Sahara weird. Desert was green during the Ice Age. Yeah. There were periods during the Ice Age when it was extremely fertile, mm -hmm. when huge rivers and lake systems existed in the Sahara. Now, when the Northern Hemisphere was fr a frozen true desert. Mm -hmm. I mean, really, Northern Europe yeah. and much of North America were uninhabitable during the Ice Age. It was yeah. so cold, so arid, so unpleasant to live in. The natural tendency would be to migrate to warmer zones. Yeah. Uh, and, and the Sahara Desert, yes, there's been some archaeology there, but very little, very little by comparison with the roughly 9 million square kilometers that the Sahara Desert covers. And I think there's also like, um, there are two examples that I'm sure you're very aware of, but um, underwater, you know, in the Cuban coast, they in 2001, they went there. Um, they were They were trying to find gold, I think. Yeah. And they finally found a city that mm. seemed to be submerged, submerged by water. Um, She's uh, rather disappeared from the public narrative. That's, a, that's it. So the Nat Geo bought the right to that story and they yeah. never published it and we never heard about it. And that's the same with the Sphinx, with yeah. the, the archive room or I don't know what, what's beneath the paw, the, the right, the, left paw. The, the, notion, the, the notion of a hall of records under the Sphinx. Well, this, I, is, I, this, is, this is an interesting point. Um, And it's one of the re one of the things that archaeologists try to do is to present themselves as real scientists. Yeah, of course. We are they they want to present themselves as people who weigh stuff, measure stuff, and count stuff. Right. Uh, they're very materialistic in that sense, and mm -hmm. they're they're extremely suspicious uh, of anything that isn't in that weighing and measuring and counting mm -hmm. narrative. And it so happened that there was an American psychic called Edgar, Ca Edgar, Edgar Casey, Casey, exactly, and he said who, we would find something. Edgar Casey made this proposition that the, the from his trance um, experiences that the the Hall of Records of Atlantis, one of several, not the only one, was hidden beneath the left forepaw of the Sphinx. Well, immediately such a notion became taboo for archaeologists they couldn't they couldn't possibly they couldn't possibly accept that any truthful information had come through trance experiences even though he said a lot of true things he did say a lot of true things um and and uh, this stopped any investigation into whether did the it? ancient egyptians themselves said things like that and they did there's there's no doubt there's there's lots of records in ancient egypt which which suggest Uh, first of all, that ancient Egyptian civilization itself is a legacy from an earlier culture. Mm -hmm. um, the story of Atlantis is um, often dismissed, usually dismissed by archaeologists. Mm -hmm. I think most people are aware that the earliest surviving reference to Atlantis comes in the works of Plato, mm -hmm. uh, and specifically in the dialogues called the Timaeus and the Critias. Mm -hmm. uh, and and um, archaeologists totally dismiss this they say that that plato just made the whole thing up yeah because it, it su suited some political or philosophical purpose no they don't even accept no. it as a myth okay so they what's accept the it they, they regard it as a fiction what? of plato's what would be the point for plato to, oh, to well, <laughs> archaeologists have reasons to say that they, okay. they say that he wanted to make a political point or a philosophical point oh, about okay. the uh, 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 about how civilizations can become over proud and over dominant <gasps> And, and self-destruct. <laughs> and self-destruct. Okay. Um, but but uh, the problem is that this has stopped archaeologists looking for what ancient Egyptian texts say about a lost civilization. And, and there's really been very important new developments in this area in the last 20 years, and that concerns a body of texts called the Edfu building texts. And they're in the Temple of Horus at Horus. Edfu. I was there, but I, I missed everything. And then I read your book and I was like, okay, I need to go back now. You need a guide to understand Between the inner on. and outer enclosure walls, there are huge numbers of texts. And these, uh, these texts uh, describe a great cataclysm that occurred in the remote past. They describe some object that came down out of the sky and struck what they call the primeval homeland of the gods and split it in two. And it was then engulfed in an enormous flood. And there were few survivors, and those survivors traveled around the world uh, seeking to recreate their civilization, seeking to teach the basics of civilization to other people. How old is this temple? It's not that well, old. The pro this is the problem, you see. The temple, the temple is a young temple. It's from the Ptolemaic period, roughly... 300 BC. Okay, yeah, so very young. So 2,300 plus years old. However, 
those texts are, are not coming written from another they're not written in the egyptian of 2300 bc they're written oh, gotcha. they're 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 written in an not older... 2300 BC. Sorry, I, mu- I must correct myself. The temple is from 300 BC, BC yeah. which means it's 2300 years oh, no. before the present, mm-hmm. roughly 2323 years before That's the present, if we want to be exact. But the texts are written in Middle Egyptian, and the language of Middle Egyptian is from 2000 BC. So that means so, it's, so, it was probably coming from a, a past temple. And they state very clearly that they're, that they're, and archaeology accepts this, that there were earlier temples on that site. Mm-hmm. And the archives of those temples were preserved by copying them in mm-hmm. hieroglyphs mm-hmm. in the language of that time, which would have involved an element of translation, mm-hmm. uh, onto the walls of the Temple of Horus at Edfu. They made a, a crumbling, deteriorating archive of papyri and material written, they quite specifically state, on animal skins into a permanent record. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. And, and one of the things that's interesting about that, Middle Egyptian, we can date back to about 2000 BC, mm-hmm. uh, in those texts, they state that this catastrophe that happened to the primeval homeland of the gods happened some 7,000 years before that. That takes us back to 9,000 BC, Which more or less. Which fits what Edgar Cayce said. And fits what Edgar Cayce said, but it also fits what Plato said. Right. Plato said that the destruction of Atlantis occurred... Well, it's a complicated story, but <laughs> Plato seemingly got the story From an passed down from the time of Solon. Solon was the great Greek lawmaker, world famous. It's fully accepted that he made a visit to Egypt round about 600 BC. And And in that visit, he went to the temple of Neith at Sais in the Delta, a temple that no longer exists. And he was intrigued by the writings on the walls. And he spoke to priests who also spoke Greek as well as Egyptian. And uh, he asked them, what do these writings say? And, and they recounted the story that is now found on, only on the Edfu building text. Uh-huh. They recounted the story of a primeval homeland of the gods, uh-huh. which in the process of translation, uh, Solon called Atlantis. It's not mm-hmm. an Egyptian word. It's mm-hmm. a, it, we're dealing with translations between multiple languages here. Yeah. He called mm-hmm. it Atlantis. The ancient mm-hmm. Egyptians didn't, and the Edfu building text is called the primeval homeland of the gods. Mm-hmm. And, and, and uh, it tells the story, virtually identical to the story in the Edfu building text, about how a great culture is destroyed in a cataclysm by and, water. and drowned by water, drowned mm-hmm. by the ocean. So Solon asks the priests, when did this happen? And they say, oh, 9,000 years ago. In a rather matter-of-fact way, well, that's 600 BC that Solon is there. The priests are saying 9,000 years ago. We have a date. We have that a date, date is 9,600 BC. And In other works. words, 11,600 or 11,623 years ago yeah. from, from, from today. Yeah. And that date coincides very precisely with the date that's given in the Edfu building text, mm-hmm. 7,000 years plus uh, before Middle Egyptian. In other words, 9,000 oh. plus BC. So, wow, well, that's fascinating. So, so, so the, the second point is that, that archaeology's attempts to refute Plato's Atlantis story, they want to isolate it from world tradition. They want to say this is just a fiction. That just was like made. The, the flood, the great flood in the Bible. Well, basically. this is the point. This is the point. Okay. <laughs> Atlantis cannot be isolated from global traditions. There is a worldwide tradition yeah. of a global cataclysm uh-huh. which destroyed an advanced civilization mm-hmm. of some sort. Mm-hmm. You find it in India, in southern India, where, mm-hmm. where my wife's family originally come from, in Tamil Nadu. There's told the story of a, a land called Kumari Kandam, uh, which had a highly sophisticated uh, civilization, where they had great academies, where we were teaching about astronomy, teaching about the shape of the earth. All of this was, 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 was present in Kumari Kandam, and mm-hmm. Kumari Kandam was, was drowned in a great flood. Guess when? About 11 and a half thousand years before our time, the same date that, 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 that is given in Plato. We have the same story in the Pacific with the lost land of, of Hiva. Mm. Uh, we, we have the story of the, the biblical flood. That's probably yeah. the one that's most familiar to people. Yeah. Yeah. the flood of Noah, but that's preceded in, in the epic of Gilgame- Gilgamesh in yeah. Mesopotamia mm-hmm. uh, by an even earlier flood story. They all point, but they all basically say the same thing, mm-hmm. that there was a high civilization of some sort uh, and that it was destroyed in a global cataclysm. Well, why can't we take into account these um, testimonies 
why mm. are we just saying that they are myth or they are it, because the notion of a of a lost civilization of the ice age and we're talking about the ice age here when we go back before eleven and a half thousand years ago pulls the rug out from under the feet of the whole edifice of archaeology. Uh, it's, something, it's something that archaeologists are most unwilling to accept. And, and this is where we enter an area which isn't scholarship, it's propaganda. Uh, let's just get rid of Atlantis. Let's just persuade people that Atlantis is a fiction Why? that was made up Why by Plato. It? Let's cut him off from the worldwide tradition of a glo global catechism. Let's actually pr pretend that, that it has no connection to that tradition. And if we must address that tradition, let's say that that was just something that people invented and made up, some kind of story, rather than something that happened. And this is, this is so contrary to reason and contrary to logic, when we yeah. know that there were episodes of enormous flooding yeah. at the end of the last ice age, when we know that sea level rose 120 meters, when we know that enormous areas of the earth were submerged by those well, rising the Sphinx sea levels. Has water erosion on well, it. Well, the water erosion on the Sphinx is a separate issue from rising sea levels. Is it? Um, and it's to do... Oh, because it was heavy it, rain. It's to do with rain. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the episode called the Younger Dryas, mm -hmm. which, which I and, and, and others pinned down as perhaps one of the most important episodes in let's use the word loosely, the relatively recent story of the human race. Remember that human beings, anatomically modern human beings, have been around for at least 300,000 years, possibly more than that. <clears throat> the date keeps on getting pushed back. Officially? But yes. We, oh. have, we have skeletal remains from Morocco, uh, which, date, uh, which are anatomically modern humans, and they're 300,000 years old. It doesn't really work with Darwin's... Evolution well, I, theory, I don't think it? it's a problem for I no? don't think it's a problem for 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 evolutionary theory. Okay, we can talk about evolutionary theory. That's a that's a that's another. That's an matter interesting one. It's all, a theory all, altogether. Yeah. Um, and perhaps we'll come on to that. But yeah. but before I lose my chain of yeah, thought, yeah. <laughs> um, the the plain fact of the matter, and it's a, it's it's a phrase that my kids have embossed on one of my T-shirts, is that stuff keeps on getting older. Mm -hmm. And by that, what I mean is that the story of anatomically modern humans keeps on getting older. Mm -hmm. Our species has been around for a very long time. And we now know that there were re closely related species, such as the ne Neanderthals, mm -hmm. such as the Denisovans, mm -hmm. who go back even earlier than 300,000 years ago, who definitely possessed the same symbolic abilities that we did. We're beginning, to, we're beginning to dispense with the notion of Neanderthals as thuggish, stupid brutes. Yeah. And we're beginning to realize that they were highly intelligent, sophisticated, sophisticated species. Mm -hmm. The thing is that as you push the horizons further and further back, you get to a place where there's actually plenty of room for something that we would recognize as a civilization to develop and to be destroyed. Mm -hmm. You know, it used to be believed not so long ago that there had been no anatomically modern humans before about 40,000 years yeah. ago. That's a much tighter time frame. But once you push that back to 300,000 years ago, vast expanses of time open up right. uh, in which all co kinds of things could have happened that aren't yet, that aren't yet properly documented. Yeah. So uh, I think that, that um, archaeology has failed to get to grips with this. I think I've failed to get to grips with the implications of this. And when there are myths or traditions or accounts like the Count of Plato, which should require them to think again. Mm -hmm. They don't think again. They just dismiss them in any mm -hmm. possible way. And that's where it becomes propagandistic. Basically, they're thinking, this is an annoying story which yeah. conflicts with our picture of the past. How can we get rid of it? We oh, it let's say topic. Plato just made it all up. Yeah, that, that's convenient. <laughs> it's convenient. Yeah, but it doesn't satisfy my curiosity and it doesn't satisfy a lot of people. So mm. I guess that's why we're calling the, the holes more and more in their narrative. And yeah. that's probably why you're being considered dangerous. Yeah. Because you're a threat to the narrative, the official I, narrative. I'm a, I'm a threat to the official narrative. Yeah. And, and, and uh, what archaeologists have tried to do in in calling me dangerous and saying that I'm a threat to the official narrative is saying, goodness knows what's going to happen next. If people start questioning us, exactly. they're going to question everything else. The election yeah. or, and you know, <laughs> how dangerous is it to question our government? And and that's where yeah. I, I'm like, is it really a bad thing to question and think for yourself? But it seems to be nowadays. Well, it, it, 
in, uh, it should be a positive thing. It should, it should be, it, but it's, it's a fundamental not done in human school. quality. <laughs> but it's but it, but it's not. It's no. some. I, I was. I, I mean, as I mentioned, I've been under attack from archaeologists since the mid 1990s. And yeah, that goes back to the question I had earlier. And I knew when when I when I presented Ancient Apocalypse, I knew that the series would be attacked by archaeologists yeah. because I'd been dealing with it for 30 years. Exactly. You know what um, it's like. I, I I I knew that it was coming, and that and and that's why I said in the series that archaeologists regard me as public enemy number one and they went ahead and proved me right by yeah. the way that they I the think way that's a good reacted. thing that you address it because it's like it's on the table and you address it right from, up from the bat so yeah. we know and, and I don't want them I don't want them saying that Hancock claims he's an archaeologist because I don't. don't I detest the word pseudo archaeologist or pseudo scientist yeah. mm -hmm. this is where <clears throat> let's um, not underestimate the power of Wikipedia Uh, if people have something they want to find out about, they've heard a little word, they've heard of somebody called Graham Hancock who's saying maybe there's a lost civilization, maybe there's a forgotten episode, the first place they go is Wikipedia. It's yeah. just easily accessed. Yeah. And, and it's not understood that Wikipedia is not an objective encyclopedia at all. Wikipedia is run by interest groups. Yeah. And, and it happens that the editors who handle my page, who have locked it to the public, the public cannot re-edit my page. If they do attempt to re-edit, the edits are removed immediately. Yeah. It happens that the very group of archaeologists who were attacking me in 1995 mm. are the group who run my Wikipedia page. Wow. So this, this cannot be an objective source. I didn't source. go and read it, but I'm sure it's very well, they, interesting the, to the read. The first thing they do is that the, the, the Graham Hancock promotes pseudo-archaeological oh, yeah. theories. So that's the way they that's the the language they use to dismiss something that they yeah. don't like they call it pseudo archaeological now yeah. the, the word pseudo if i understand the etymology correct means false mm. false archaeological mm. theories mm -hmm. um and and um i don't know how they know that i don't know what <laughs> right they have to say that yeah uh I am simply saying that I don't agree with yeah. what they say. Yeah. And I'm presenting evidence. I've, I've written a large number of books. Yeah. These books are of very great length. Some of them have as, as many as 2,000 footnotes in them. Mm -hmm. I reference all my sources very, very carefully. Mm -hmm. I can't be a pseudo-archaeologist if I don't claim to be an archaeologist. Exactly. I claim to be what I am, a writer with, yeah. a, with a background in journalism yeah. who attempts to do very thorough and detailed research. So do you have other uh, sci scientists or archaeologists that are backing your theories? No. No? <laughs> no <laughs> okay. not, not, not really. Okay. There, are, there are certain areas. I've, yeah. I've, I've taken a great interest in, in what's called the Younger Dryas impact hypothesis. Yeah. The Younger Dryas is a, is a fascinating episode in human prehistory. It's we 1,200 know, years? Well, we know, that, we know that roughly 12,800 years ago, For the for the thousand or two year two thousand years before that, the world had been warming up, and there had been a gradual meltdown of the ice sheets. Then suddenly, the world went into a very intense cold period. Mm. Became extremely cold everywhere on the planet. Everywhere on the planet, it was a global it was a global phenomenon, um, and this cold period lasted for about one thousand two hundred years mm -hmm. until eleven thousand six hundred years ago. Uh, and then the world very rapidly warmed up again. Mm -hmm. I mean, let's be clear, the, the, the concern about climate change today mm -hmm. is nothing, just minuscule mm -hmm. by comparison with what happened during the Younger Dryas. Mm -hmm. Those huge climate shifts from getting warm to getting incredibly cold, from being incredibly cold for 1,200 years and then getting massively warm again suddenly, Nothing and like when that you is say happening suddenly, today. Like, what are we talking? Like a we're, human we're talking, lifetime, we're, or we're, we're talking about a human lifetime? Yeah, very, very fast. Okay, very, very, very quick. Uh, and could it be a, a pole shift, or we're not discussing a pole shift here? Um, I, I don't know if it was a pole shift. The answer, the answer, that's a matter we should pay attention to. Mm -hmm. And I, I paid attention to that in my book, Fingerprints of the Gods, in 1995. Yeah. But what happened since 2007 was that a group of real scientists, not journalists Not you, like not a pseudo-archaeologist A group like of you. real scientists began to wonder if there had been uh, a series of impacts from fragments of a disintegrating comet mm -hmm. uh, around 12,800 years ago. And they did so on the basis of what is called the Younger Dryas boundary layer. And you can see it exposed in a number of places. Mur Murray Springs in, in Arizona. You go there in your series. I do. Yeah. And, and you can see that it's a layer in the soil which is about the thickness of a human hand. Mm -hmm. And it's very dark. It's called, mm -hmm. often called the black mat. 
and it's full of objects, uh, nano diamonds, uh, melt glass, platinum. Uh, it's full of objects that are best explained by an extraterrestrial impact. I don't mean aliens. I mean, mm -hmm. I mean a, a fundamentally a comet uh -huh. that, that breaks up into multiple fragments. A lot of the criticism of the Younger Dryas impact hypothesis has been, where's the crater? But that's not what the hypothesis proposes. Mm -hmm. It proposes that a very large comet, perhaps as much as 100 kilometers, maybe 200 kilometers in diameter, entered the inner solar system. It uh, fragmented into Well, smaller it entered parts? the inner solar system intact, in their view, around 20,000 years ago. Wow. And it went into an orbit that crossed the orbit of the Earth. Uh, but because of gravitational forces, this is very common for comets. No scientist would deny this. Comets fragment. Mm -hmm. They break up into multiple pieces. Yeah. And when they do so, instead of having one large object, you have tens of thousands of smaller objects mm -hmm. that spread out into a very wide meteor stream. Mm -hmm. And in the case of the what's called the torrid meteor stream, which is believed to be the culprit in this case, you're looking at a meteor stream that's 30 million kilometers wide. The Earth takes 12 and a half days to pass through it on its orbit, and it passes through the torrid meteor stream twice a year. Oh, wow. The suggestion, and it still does, the, suge the suggestion is that 12,800 years ago, some very large fragments in that meteor stream hit the Earth. Mm -hmm. They didn't, in most cases, actually impact with the surface of the Earth. They were air bursts. They broke up in the atmosphere. Okay. Uh, and, and we can have a very recent example of that, which is the Tunguska event in Siberia, which took place on the 30th of June, 1908. That was a fragment, almost certainly out of the torrid meteor stream, that was no more than 100 meters in diameter. It didn't reach the surface of the Earth. It exploded in the sky. Mm. And this is usually what happens with, with air bursts. And it still had an impact? It had a massive impact. So what, why, it, it, why it, does it It flattened it 80 million trees across 2,000 square kilometers. Uh, it oh. was fortunate for the human race that this was in an uninhabited area yeah. of the Earth. Mm -hmm. But when researchers went there, they found this massive devastation. Mm. And if the Tunguska event had happened over a major city, the entire population of that city would have been, would have been destroyed. Oh, yeah. Um, and, and what is proposed in the Younger Dryas impact hypothesis, there may well have been impacts with the surface of the Earth, but the primary focus of those was on the North American and the Northern European ice caps. Mm. Now, let's remember that 12,800 years ago, those ice caps were still a couple of kilometers deep. Mm -hmm. So if you have an object half a kilometer wide that doesn't explode in the atmosphere but hits an ice cap mm -hmm. it's not going to leave a crater in the mm. ground below it's going to create a crater in the ice cap mm -hmm. uh, and and th when the ice melts away that crater will no longer be right. no longer be visible so it doesn't leave a trace it it leaves a trace in the younger driest boundary layer okay. which is all over the world it's found it's found in north america it's found in south america it's found in belgium it's found in and as somehow far it's not Syria. officially accepted no it's accepted that it that it exists uh, okay. but but it's disputed as to what caused it Okay, uh, okay. And those scientists who propose the Younger Dryas impact hypothesis have themselves come under a great deal of criticism and, and Why still is do. That? Um, because there are others who are invested in other theories who don't like it. For okay. example, the, the theory that the um, great megafauna of the Ice Age, the uh, woolly mammoths, the, mm -hmm. <coughs> the woolly rhinos, the mastodons, mm -hmm. the giant sloths, they all went extinct during the Younger Dryas. They all went extinct yeah. between 12,800 and 11,600 years ago. There's a huge body of opinion in archaeology that wants to claim <coughs> that that extinction of the megafauna was caused by overhunting by human beings. Uh, we like to, uh, to, to put every responsibility on the human beings. On, the being. human, on yeah. human beings. Uh, and therefore, them. those who are invested in that notion find the Younger Dryas impact hypothesis a threat. Because if the Younger Dryas impact hypothesis is correct, then those animals were not made extinct by overhunting. And I can't yeah. think of a single hunter-gatherer society in the world today, and some still exist, which overhunt. Never they, happens. They live in harmony they with do, their yeah. with, 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 with with the creatures that they survive upon. They would yeah. not. They would never wipe them out. And I don't think human beings wiped out the megafauna either. Mm -hmm. I think the best explanation for the wiping out of the megafauna is this series of impacts of comet fragments all around the world, mm -hmm. and the climate change that followed. 
See, at the moment, the, it's fully accepted that there was a massive climate change at the yeah. beginning of the Younger Dryas, 12,800 years ago, and yeah. another massive climate change 11,600 years ago mm. at the end of the Younger Dryas. But the explanation is given is completely different. They say that the world went into that deep freeze because what's called the global meridional overturning circulation, of which the Gulf Stream is the best known part, mm -hmm. uh, was, was um, interrupted by meltwater coming off the ice caps. And, that, and they accept that as the uh, only necessary explanation. They never ask themselves, why did the meltwater come off the ice caps? No. Why did it come off in huge quantities suddenly? Uh -huh. And that's what the Younger Dryas impact hypothesis answers. Yeah. It says that these air bursts and impacts on the ice caps caused the shock and the heat generated by mm -hmm. those, those events caused a sudden melting of the ice and that 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 ice then flowed into the world ocean and then indeed did cut the gulf stream what is the flood we're talking about or would the flood be later on well the interesting the interesting thing if you get into the fine details on the younger dryas you will find something very puzzling but 12,800 years ago just as the world entered that deep freeze sea levels rose very rapidly mm. uh, that shouldn't happen shouldn't happen when the world is going into a freeze all that excess water should be piled up on the ice caps yeah. it shouldn't be going into the world ocean mm -hmm. and yet it did uh, it's been absolutely confirmed from from bahamian corals which can only survive at a, a, a few meters under the surface of the sea they have to have they have a very close relationship with the mm -hmm. sea and if the sea gets deeper than five meters or so above them they drown they can't survive anymore that drowning of corals uh, 12,800 years ago is clear evidence of a huge rise in sea level okay. at that time uh, and and then when you come to the end of the younger dryas 11,600 years ago uh, you have this massive warming that takes place uh, and you have another flood then and that's called meltwater pulse 1b okay. and that 11,600 years ago date is the date that coincides with Plato's story of Atlantis that's when he says Atlantis went under 9,000 years before the time of Solon yeah. 11,600 years before our time it's the date that coincides with the date given in the Edfu building texts um, and and the question is what caused that sudden warming uh -huh. And on this, there, there is much less work being done than on the problem of the beginning of the Younger Dryas. Mm -hmm. uh, I go back to the work of Sir Fred Hoyle, who was a great astronomer, passed away now, who long ago um, was, was looking at this problem. And he, su he suggested that the sudden warming at the end of the Younger Dryas was caused by a comet impact, not impacting an ice cap, not air bursting, but hitting an ocean, hitting a major ocean, sending up a huge cloud of water vapor into the upper atmosphere, creating a massive instant global warming effect mm. and resulting in this sudden rise in sea level and sudden rise in global temperatures. It's interesting because he suggested that long before the Younger Dryas impact hypothesis was mm -hmm. ever proposed. It seemed to him and it's the best match expert. And it's matching it's, uh, the, the theory. Well, it does. It, match, it matches the theory because you would expect with a meteor stream, and, and I repeat yeah. that what is called the torrid meteor stream, which we presently pass through at the end of June and at the end of October, uh, we pass through it twice a year, uh, that the, 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 we would expect to have not just one episode of impacts, we'd expect to have multiple episodes of impact. Just like the Tunguska event in 1908 is also from an object that I believe fell out of the torrid meteor stream because the 30th of June 1908 coincides with the peak of what is called the beta torrids. They mm. are the most likely culprit for that. We are we are in a relationship with this meteor stream, mm -hmm. and this meteor and that relationship isn't just 12,800 years old. It's a relationship that still continues today. There are very large objects still in the torrid meteor stream, some of which are are fully recognized by by mainstream astronomers. Mm -hmm. uh, the best known is called Comet Enki. Yeah, I heard about and that. And Comet Enki is about six kilometers in diameter. That's an Earth killer. Yeah. You get something like that hits the Earth intact, and it's going to... We're gone. Virtually, it, we're pretty much gone. We're, yeah. we're the dinosaurs. Yeah. Um, and and uh, we cross the orbit of the torrid meteor stream. Now, fortunately, it's 30 million kilometers wide. There are multiple filaments of debris, mm -hmm. and we haven't in recent past hit a very large object, but the possibility is always there yeah. that, we, that we will, and some calculations suggest that we might do so within the next 30 or 40 years. Well, I have a question. I, I want to say something very okay, clearly. Sure. The Younger Dryas impact hypothesis provides an answer 
to my mystery of a lost civilization of the Ice Age. Mm-hmm. Um, that- you don't lose a civilization without some kind of cataclysmic event taking right. place. It, do, yeah. it just doesn't happen. Mm-hmm. It doesn't suddenly disappear from the world without mm-hmm. a great cataclysm occurring. And the best mm-hmm. evidence for a massive cataclysm 12,800 years ago, which is around the date that I've always been proposing, even before I knew about the Younger Dryas impact hypothesis, mm-hmm. uh, is that we have that cataclysm uh, with the initiation, with the onset of the Younger Dryas. And I want to be clear that the scientists who have evolved the Younger Dryas impact hypothesis, they're not interested in whether or not there was a lost civilization. That's not their thing. Yeah. Mm-hmm. They are simply saying that there was a gigantic global cataclysm 12,800 years ago. Yeah. It was a long-term event. It lasted for 1,200 years, and it saw the extinction of all the megafauna mm-hmm. all mm-hmm. around the world and obviously had a huge impact on human populations. But they, they don't go the next step, which I go, and yeah. say that one of those human populations, perhaps several of them, were at a much more sophisticated level of development than archaeologists attribute to the peoples of the ice age that's my idea but how did they okay so uh, we were talking about the sphinx and i'd like to go back to the sphinx because you're talking about the rain uh water and i'm wondering in your opinion why was it built and was it built before uh the they got wiped out Cause I, i can't imagine like let's put ourselves back 12,000 yeah. years ago and if we're experiencing something like that i guess we're not in a position to go and build a sphinx like you have to be uh, the evidence suggests the sphinx was already there 12,800 years ago mm-hmm. um it was uh, it was a monument that existed before the younger dryas mm. and and that in the case of the sahara desert and The place where the Sphinx sits is part of the Sahara Desert. In the case of the Sahara Desert, what happened 12,800 years ago, just as other parts of the world went into a deep freeze, further south there was heavy rain. There were thousands and thousand years, actually, more than a thousand years of extremely heavy rain on the Sahara Desert during the Younger Dryas. And we know that for a fact? Yes, we know that for a fact. There's no no doubt about it. It Nobody questions that. Nobody questions that. Okay. But what they do question is the what's called the precipitation-induced weathering on the Sphinx. And I want to pay tribute here to the work of Professor of Geology Robert Schock, Mm -hmm. Professor of Geology at Boston University, uh, who was introduced to the Sphinx by the late, great John Anthony West, who was a dear friend of mine. John had always felt that the Sphinx was much older than than uh, mainstream archaeology accepts. What's the official uh, date for the Officially, Sphinx? the Sphinx 4, is supposed to be about 2,500 BC, in other words, 4,500 years ago. Yeah. Um, but the evidence of that it was exposed to about 1,000 years of heavy rainfall means that it must be much older than that because there was no such rainfall in Egypt four and a half thousand years yeah. ago. And you have to go back to the Younger Dryas to find that humid, wet period. So that would mean that there were humans living, like the civilization was still there during this rain. Yeah, uh, it, it would mean that it was there before the rain, uh, before, okay. before the Younger Dryas. The Sphinx already stood there. Now, right. when archaeologists criticize this, the notion that the Sphinx is older, This used to be the standard response uh, when I and my colleagues argued that the Sphinx is much older than 4,500 years old. They would say, no, that's impossible. The Sphinx is the work of an advanced civilization. There Mm. could be, there could be, we would find hundreds of monuments like that all around the world uh, if a civilization of that sort existed. So obviously the Sphinx just dates to 4,500 years ago. And there was a famous quotation from the American archaeologist Mark Lehner, who, who said, just show me a single potsherd from that period. Uh, well, the thing is that they've not revised that position mm-hmm. since the discovery of Gobekli Tepe in mm-hmm. Turkey. Gobekli Tepe in Turkey is a gigantic megalithic site. Mm-hmm. It's highly sophisticated. If you can create Gobekli Tepe, you can create the Sphinx. And Gobekli Tepe dates to 11,600 years ago, the end of the Younger Dryas. How do we know that for sure? We know that for sure from carbon dating. Okay. Uh, Carbon dating is often a very suspect dating yeah. method. Why? Uh, because you can't date stone. Yeah. There is no technique to date, to date stone, particularly if that stone has been exposed to the atmosphere for a very long time. Uh, what carbon dating does is it dates organic material mm-hmm. that is associated uh, with the stone. Now, the problem with that is that in many archaeological sites, the, the great temples of Malta are an example, 
the carbon dating is not reliable because those those structures have been open to the world for a very long time. Many different cultures have been there, have been through them, uh, and have left their mark upon them. And it's very difficult to say where this piece of organic material, when that piece of or organic material was deposited, may not be the time that the monuments were created. It may be quite a different time. Right. You know what you really want, and as far as I'm aware, this has not been found anywhere on, for example, Malta. What you want is a is a piece of organic material that you can carbon date, which is trapped underneath a giant megalith. And then you can begin to make the assumption that the right. megalith was put there according to the date of that or organic material. Mm -hmm. um, but this is, uh, th this is impossible in the case of the Sphinx. Uh, the Sphinx is carved out of solid rock. Uh, and it cannot be carbon dated. And no Egyptologist will claim that they've carbon dated the Sphinx. Yeah. They, they attribute the date to the Sphinx uh, based uh, entirely on context. They, and, and that context is suspect. They say that the pyramids date to about 4,500 years ago. The Sphinx is part of the pyramid complex, yeah. and therefore everything is 4,500 years old. Well, that's all supposition. Uh, it's, yeah, not, and it's not it's, fact. And, and it's the official story, and it's set in stone, it's and set in no stone. one questions that. Nobody, nobody's supposed to question We're it. We're not supposed it's kind do. of heresy. This is where yeah, this is, is where archaeology functions, and a lot of science today functions this way, like a religion, mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. that everybody's just supposed to accept what scientists say. I can't accept this official narrative because to me it's very obvious that it's flawed. Doesn't make sense mm. to me, and I, I think it's. I'm just applying critical thinking here. It's it's very obvious to me that no one could build this pyramid. I, I think it's a hundred years that the official. Oh, the Great Pyramid uh, of Giza is supposed to be built in twenty three years. They don't. Uh, even build like a triplex in Montreal in 20 years so I can't <laughs> exactly. see how it's a it's a fair point and and um, the, the 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 great pyramid uh, is one of the most gigantic and complex monuments that exists anywhere in the world my wife Santa and I have climbed the Great Pyramid five times. We why 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 did you want to climb the pyramid? What a what a joy what a, Weren't what you afraid a, to, to what trip or just like kill yourself? Or? Somebody's killed every year falling off the Great Pyramid. That's it could one have of, been you, Graham. Could have been. <laughs> okay. that's, that's one of the reasons why the, the Egyptian government has now made it a, a criminal offence to crime they the, banned climb you, the Great Pyramid. Did you? Are you banned in Egypt? I am presently banned in Egypt. Is, is that because uh, of your climbing? No, uh, it's, because, it's because my point of view disagrees with the point of view of Egypt. This bothers Egypt. them more than the fact that you climbed the pyramid. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The, 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 the basic the basic issue is Atlantis. Egyptologists hate the idea of Atlantis. You don't really talk much about Atlantis, do you? I don't feel like you, you talk that um, much about I don't, it. I don't talk about it more than I talk about any other flood yeah. myth from, from, from all around the world. But this one is a, it's a crime it's, it, it's held a against particular, you? It r raises particular hostility oh among, amongst archaeologists. And, and, and they say, oh, so you're suggesting ancient Egyptian civilization didn't have its own unique origin. They actually oh, have, were influenced okay. by somebody outside. So oh. it, it excites sort of nationalistic. Okay. Okay. feelings as well but i don't know any single human culture that hasn't been influenced by other cultures that's part of being human yeah exactly we learn we stuff share. from other people we share we pass yeah. on our knowledge we receive their knowledge that's how things that's how things work why should egypt be any different why should any yeah. cu culture in the ancient world so you were going to say you climbed the pyramid five times yes and on one of those climbs uh and it was particularly noticeable um, it was on um, what is called the Eid, the holiday that followed immediately follows the end of Ramadan, mm. where people have been fasting mm -hmm. for a month. And uh, tens of thousands of Kyrenes were out on the Giza Plateau having picnics. Oh. And uh, some of them, hundreds of them, decided, we're going to climb the pyramid. And Santa and I joined them. You did. We climbed oh. the pyramid with them. Are and that's th our previous climbs and subsequent climbs had been on our own. Yeah. But that climb, we were accompanied by hundreds and hundreds of people from Cairo. Who Didn't were all you feel like you were like transgressing some sacred monument or some sort? I, I, don't, I don't regard it that way. No? I, think, I think the Great Pyramid invites us to transgress it. <laughs> it's okay. there posing a huge question. It's mm -hmm. saying, figure me out. Yeah, that's really Figure me saying. out. I am standing here. I am almost perfectly oriented to true north. My scale and dimensions coincide, uh, provide a code for the scale and dimensions of the Earth, and that scale is of one to forty-three thousand two hundred, which is not a random. A very important number. It's a very important number. There's, it's not a random number at mm -hmm. all. Height of the Great Pyramid, the real height, four hundred eighty-one feet. Uh, I can't. 
How immediately translate that into meters. <laughs> um, the, the Great Pyramid is a bit shorter now because it doesn't have its capstone. Yeah, but they're um, almost the same size. But it, it, the, 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 if you measure the Great Pyramid today, there's a flat platform yeah. on top of it, and that's about 450 feet above, uh, uh, above ground level. But it was originally 481 feet tall, and you can tell that just by continuing the angle of yep. the pyramid up to, mm -hmm. the, up to the top. That figure multiplied by 43,200 gives you the polar radius of the Earth. And the base perimeter of the Great Pyramid multiplied by the same number gives you the equatorial circumference of the Earth. And I don't think that's random. I think be. that's genuine. And I think, it's, I think it is there to pose a huge question about mm. our past. I think the pyramid was designed to make people think. And it was it's created designed. by people who thought, who thought very carefully. And they weren't just making a tomb for a pharaoh. Oh, for they sure. were doing something much more important than that. They were creating a permanent message but i'm still scratching future. my head why did they make it so complicated so we don't even get it like it's it well we can begin to get it if we open our eyes and if we listen to the, what the pyramid has to say but, if we listen to what it has to say that almost perfect alignment to true north um and i say three sixtieths of a single degree off true north because a degree in astronomy is divided into 60 minutes three sixtieths of a single degree off true north is a is a tiny error yeah uh, it's an error but it's a very tiny error. Can you give us like an, an example of what, what does it represent? Like well, in our, it, it, with it, our technology today, would, would we be able to be more precise than could that? Could we do that? Yes. Mm -hmm. Would we do that? No. Mm -hmm. uh, what's the point? What's the point of going, you're already creating a monument that's almost impossible to build, uh, which yeah. consists of 6 million tons of stone, mm -hmm. which has a footprint of more than 13 acres, which is 481 feet high. You're creating this, you're, you're creating something that's difficult anyway. It's not easy to build a pyramid. A lot of archaeologists suggest it's easy. It's not. You make a mistake at ground level, and by the time you get to the summit, you've got a corkscrew, oh, not, a, not, not a yeah. pyramid. It's, yeah. it's, it's, a very, it's a very difficult thing to to do yeah um so great attention was paid to the creation of this structure and the relation with the sky as well with the well Hawaiian if you belt. listen to the pyramid first of all the, that tiny error that tiny human error tells us that these were this was a culture that paid attention to astronomy you can't get Very that much. level of accuracy without using astronomy mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you can't you can't just figure out what true no. and, and forget about compasses yeah. compasses do not give us true north or south, it's or magnetic. east, or west. They give us magnetic north, yeah. which can be as much as 11 degrees off true north. Yeah. They're a rough guide to uh -huh. where north is, but they're not an accurate. If you want accuracy, you've got to use the stars. Yeah. And so, first of all, the, the Great Pyramid is saying to us, we use the stars. It says it to us in a number of ways. There are, there are four narrow shafts that are cut through the body of the Great Pyramid. Two of them emanate from the so-called King's Chamber, mm -hmm. uh, which is the highest of the, the three great chambers in the Great Pyramid, and they do exit on the outside of the body of the pyramid. Two and of we them, don't know what they're for. Well, I, I think we do know what they're for. Yeah. Again, if you listen to the pyramid. Um, oh, they're pointing at They're pointing at, at, at specific stars. stars. And, yeah. th and this is one of the enigmas of the Great Pyramid. Let me be clear. Two shafts running from the King's Chamber right to the outside of the Great Pyramid. We know that they run all the way through the pyramid because in Victorian times, people would roll cannonballs down them and those cannonballs would end up in the King's Chamber. They would climb up the outside, roll a metal cannonball down them and lo and behold, they turned up in the King's Chamber. So they definitely are from the King's Chamber and they exit yeah. on the outside. The ones in the Queen's Chamber do not exit on the outside of the Great Pyramid. And until 1872, they weren't apparent on the inside of the Queen's Chamber either. It took a curious person... Uh, to the one who used dynamite in the no, pyramid? that's Howard Weiss. Yeah. He, he, he was an, he was another one. This yeah. this one was was actually a British Freemason who who oh. was interested in the fact that there were shafts in the king's chamber, and he went around knocking on the walls of the queen's chamber, and he found two hollow points, and he cut those out because you could do that in the 1870s. He cut those out, and lo and behold, they open into shafts, and those shafts are about this high and this wide. And they go horizontal for some distance, and then they rise up at an angle. And that angle, the angle of all four shafts, points at key stars. And this is where it becomes puzzling, mm. because those key stars are in the position that they were in in 2500 exactly, BC. Exactly, that's where I was puzzled with your book. I, they're, I, I, they're, they're, in the, they're in the position that they were in in 2500 how, BC. How, and this is why possible? I would. This is why I would never divorce the ancient Egyptians from the completion 
of the pyramid project because the other aspect of it is the pattern of the three pyramids on the ground. And once you accept, as I do, the notion that the three great pyramids replicate the pattern of the three stars of the, const the belt of the constellation right. of Orion and take into account the phenomenon known as precession, which mm -hmm. is a wobble on the axis of the Earth that changes from our viewpoint, the positions of the stars as they appear in the sky. Once you take that into account, you're looking at the shape of Orion's belt on the ground as it was 12 and a half thousand years ago. So weirdly, we have a ground layout which speaks to 12,500 years ago, close, very close to 12,800 years ago. And then we're looking at shafts, which point to 2,500 BC, 4,500 years So the years shafts ago. could have been added later on? I think so. I think we have to take the ancient Egyptians seriously. They say that their knowledge was a legacy from what they call the first time, from Zeptepi. Uh, so and and, and I, I would not say that the ancient Egyptians did not build the pyramids. I think they were closely involved mm -hmm. in the construction of the pyramids, and I think they used preserved knowledge that had been passed down from thousands of years before. They were completing a project that had been begun thousands of years earlier. So if I envisage the Giza Plateau 12,500 years ago, what I see there are three relatively low megalithic platforms laid out in exactly the pattern because the, the pyramids were then built on top of them. The Great Pyramid itself is well, built... That's where I guess I'm skeptical because I can't, I guess in my perception of today, I can't imagine starting a project thinking, oh, they're going to finish it in 8,000 years. Like it's, it seems impossible to me. And it's such a major project that mm. I would feel that when you start doing this project, you start in the idea that you're going to finish it. Mm. So when I was reading your book, I was, I was trying to keep an open mind, but I... It seemed to me that that's where I feel like I can't really wrap my mind around it. I just, I, it seems that this project is so huge, so wide, that it had to be made in an idea. And how can they be sure that thousands of year later, years later, we would, like the Egyptians would take their legacy and finish what they had started if they were trying to give us a message or fair, something? It's a fair point. Uh, but to me, the answer, the answer to that is simple. Uh, we have such things as secret societies. We have, mm -hmm. we have such things as the transmission of knowledge over thousands and thousands of years. I mean, nobody mm -hmm. would dispute that the origins of the Old Testament in the Bible go back 4,000 years. And there's a continuity from then right through until today. Ideas are passed down, they're transmitted. I'm only suggesting that it was the same in ancient You think Egypt. it was, so that would, that would be sort of the same story with Plato, saying that he received this story from a 600 years uh, ancestor that lived 600 years before him. Yeah, who was being told a story that was even older. Never, and that's why I need to put my, my, myself in this mindset that they probably respected the past way more than we do now. Look, and they... I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go out on a limb here and tell you what I think happened. I think there was a lost civilization of the Ice Age. I think there were survivors. I think they did attempt to reinitiate civilization, but they weren't quite able to do so. They created, uh, if you like, secret societies all around the world, which persisted for thousands of years, initiates to whom knowledge was passed down, waiting for the right moment to switch civilization back on again. If your project is to reinitiate civilization and you discover that you can't do it at a particular time, the world during the Younger Dryas was a very complicated So you assume place. that people lived during that period of time? Oh yes, people, people definitely lived and def we know they did. Survived. There's no, there's no doubt about it. Yeah, all around uh, but the world. What, but what I'm suggesting is that the project was put on hold for thousands of years. And it's very odd how all around the world, roughly 5,000 to 4,500 years ago, civilizations pop up everywhere. Yeah. Consider the pyramids of, of Corral in Peru, about 5,000 years old. Consider the Giza project and, and the whole beginning of the first dynasty in Egypt, about 5,000 years ago, the first dynasty begins. Consider Mesopotamia, roughly 5,000 years ago. It all switches on all at once, Which all is over a the mystery world. as well. It's a mystery in itself. How can you start there being already so knowledgeable that you're able to build the Great Pyramid? It's like, oh, the first thing I build and it's perfect. Yeah, it's a very, it's a very odd thing. And mm -hmm. I'm suggesting that there was a body of preserved knowledge. And the notion of a hall of records of Atlantis under the Great Sphinx yeah, yeah, might be a part of that.
that that, that knowledge was deliberately preserved, and that that, um, if you like, secret society, that group of initiates who passed the knowledge down from generation to generation, they that would select sense. the brightest and the best. The priests in Egypt. They would, would select had... the brightest and the best from the local population, right. and they would initiate them into their system of knowledge. That makes sense. And gradually, a time would come where it made sense to switch civilization on again and i think that's what happened in ancient was there Egypt. you think a, like a, a shift in energy or do you think there was like some some kind of a, a paradigm shift where they felt like how do you explain that suddenly they they built the pyramids uh, or they built you know very huge monuments i don't see how i don't see how the great pyramid could have been built without an inheritance of knowledge yeah uh, as, as you say um it's it, You would expect the first thing that's built to be relatively primitive. Yeah. You would expect to see signs of evolution yeah. ahead of the Great Pyramid. It's like my, my baby's drawing and her drawings are not very good, but she's improving yeah, you know, as, improving. as she draws. And it seems that's to what, be how that's we work. That's what we normally expect, but that's not what we see in Egypt. No. We see the best being the oldest and we see that mm -hmm. a decline. The pyramids of the fifth and sixth dynasties are very poor yeah. by comparison with the pyramids They didn't, when to the you go, they just look like... Uh, look like crumbling hills, yeah, exactly, little yeah. crumbling hills. Yeah. Pyramid of Unas, for example, which has fantastic texts written inside it. But uh, it's falling apart. It's falling apart. It, 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 it's a very poor work of construction by comparison. And yet the Great Pyramid and its two companions are, are perfect. They are. Almost perfect. And, and, yeah. and I would say that we are looking at the application of a much more ancient system of knowledge there. That's the best mm -hmm. way I can explain yeah. the enigma to myself the right. enigma of star alignments that speak to two epochs that speak to 4,500 years before our time and that speaks to 12,500 years before our time so what about the sphinx and the the archive room underneath this it's part so his name is shock the geologist Robert that Schock, yeah, yeah. worked on it he's the one who discovered it am i correct no 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 um i think we have to give that credit to john anthony west and even before him to a to a scholar called uh, Schwaller de Lubix. So they use like a technology, like radar, sonar no, technology? No, in initially or? it was just a perception. Schwaller de Lubix looked at the Sphinx back in the 1920s, 1930s, and he, he just made a passing remark that it looks like this Sphinx has been subject to some kind of water erosion. Um, and then John Anthony West, who was a dear friend of ours, who, who passed away in 2018, Uh, John Anthony West took that further and he began to examine the Sphinx closely and looking at the erosion patterns on it and trying to explain them to himself. And then he got in touch with Robert Schock at Boston University, who is an accredited geologist, mm -hmm. and he asked him to come to Egypt. And Schock then made a close study of the Great Sphinx, which involved much more than just looking at it. It involved seismic work as well, which identified a chamber under the left forepaw of the Sphinx. That's um, what happened. And, and he came to the conclusion that the weathering patterns on the Sphinx were caused by exposure to more than a thousand years of extremely heavy rainfall. And then we have to invoke the science of paleoclimatology. When was there last a period of heavy rainfall in that part of the Sahara Desert? Yeah. Answer, the Younger Dryas, mm -hmm. between 12,800 and 11,600 years ago. So from his point of view, the Sphinx was, was weathered by heavy rains during that period, between mm -hmm. 12,800 and 11,600 years ago. Doesn't, doesn't mean that that's when the Sphinx was built. No. Uh, there was the, some the word built is wrong period. the sphinx was carved out of solid bedrock yeah it wasn't built at all but was, they added um some rocks and well the the, the, those are all rest let me be clear i'm i'm going to speak of myself and my colleagues here professor robert shock john anthony west very important robert boval who's done the most important and significant work on the, well? on the astronomy of ancient egypt mm -hmm. well Ro you robert, co wrote a book Ro we, robert and i wrote a book together robert yeah. is actually belgian but he was born in egypt i thought he, his accent his, was belgian yeah. i was trying to figure out what was his, his soul his soul is egyptian okay. for sure that's that's his that's his true culture mm -hmm. and and um he is a, a brilliant archaeo astronomer he's mm -hmm. done a great deal of astronomy work there's nobody who matches him in 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 this field we're all of the view that the great sphinx and i'd like to mention another more recent researcher manu safzade uh who uh, has done a great deal he is fluent in ancient egyptian hieroglyphs 
Wow. It's also fluent in the German language. This is important because the Edfu building texts that I mentioned earlier mm-hmm. uh, were partially translated when I first worked on them, but they've now been completely translated into German. Uh, and that complete, complete translation absolutely vindicates the notion that the Edfu building texts are telling the same story as the story of Atlantis. And it's only gradually filtering out into the outside world oh. because it's in German and needs to be translated into more widely spoken languages yeah. uh, in okay. order to get there. All of us are the view of the view that the Great Sphinx was originally not only a lion-bodied monument, but also a lion-headed monument. It, it was a lion. It was a huge lion. The Great Sphinx is oriented perfectly due east. And therefore it looks at the point on the horizon where the sun rises on the equinox, on the spring equinox, 21st of March, and on the autumn equinox, 21st of September. Now we get into complicated areas here, but uh, the If you go to astrology, which again archaeologists will dismiss as complete nonsense, if you go to astrology, we live presently in the age of Pisces. Mm -hmm. Why? Because the constellation that rises behind the sun on the spring equinox is the constellation of Pisces Mm -hmm. in our age. But the old song has it right. We live in the dawning of the age of Aquarius. Mm -hmm. And within about 100 or 150 years, this precessional wobble of the earth the earth is the viewing platform from which we observe the stars if it's wobbling on its axis it's going to change the positions of the stars as we perceive them in the sky and most importantly it's going to change the pole star Mm -hmm. presently our pole star is polaris Mm -hmm. but as that axis does this over a cycle of twenty six thousand years other stars have been the pole star Mm -hmm. and other stars will be the pole star in the future and sometimes no star will occupy the area of space uh, Mm -hmm. to which the the pole of the earth points it will also affect the constellations of the zodiac that rise behind the sun at key moments of the year the spring equinox the autumn equinox and the two solstices Um, and we live in the age of pisces because it's the constellation of pisces that presently houses the sun in our age Before us, it was the constellation of Aries. It's not an accident that during the age of Aries, the ancient Egyptians' uh, symbology was all about rams. Yeah, they're everywhere. You know, before that, it was the age of Taurus. Uh, Taurus housed the sun on the spring equinox. Again, is it in this Karnak is, that you get all the... Well, you have the ram-headed sphinxes you, in Karnak, which, yeah. which are built during the age of Aries. Mm-hmm. Um, it's not an accident that the early Christians used the fish as their symbol because yeah. they were in, in the time of the, the, the age of Pisces. And the, 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 the bottom line to all of this is that in that epoch of 12,800 to 11,600 years ago, that cataclysmic epoch that we now call the Younger Dryas, the constellation that housed the sun on the spring equinox was the constellation of Leo. So well, that, that would be <coughs> enough to convince anyone. It doesn't, it doesn't convince archaeologists. But, but when you combine the two sciences, when you combine astronomy uh-huh. and realize that 12,500, 12,800 years ago, the Sphinx was gazing directly at its own celestial counterpart yeah. at dawn on the spring equinox. When you combine that with the geology that says that in exactly that period there was enormous rainfall that caused the erosion on the body of the Sphinx, then we have a much more effective method of dating the Sphinx than yeah. any kind of carbon dating, which we can't do on yeah. the body of the Great Sphinx. We have geology and we have astronomy, and both sciences coincide on dating the Sphinx to more than 12,000 years ago. Yeah. Uh, and And... It may well be much more than 12,000 years ago. It could go back to the previous. Which would be 36,000 years ago. Which would be 36,000 years ago. That's way too far for a lot of people, Uh, I think, uh, here. uh, uh, (laughs) And and even for me. I think think that the the Sphinx is best tied to the epoch of about 12,500 years ago. Yeah. Um, and, and it was a lion-bodied monument. Then came this heavy, heavy rainfall. It destroyed that leonine head. Uh, it became heavily eroded and damaged. And in the time of the ancient Egyptians, who saw themselves as the successor of an earlier culture, who were completely open and honest about that, who said they received all their knowledge from the gods, the gods. 
who saw themselves as the heirs, as, 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 as the recipients of a legacy from that time, they saw the very damaged head of the Leonine head of the Sphinx and they recarved it mm-hmm. uh, into a human head wearing the classic Nemes headdress of an Egyptian pharaoh. Mm-hmm. Egyptologists say that proves the Sphinx was built by the ancient Egyptians. No, the I don't think The head is so. smaller than the rest of the, the body. The head is much smaller than the rest of the body. Yeah. It's completely out of proportion. Yeah. It's a restoration project on yeah. a very damaged, very ancient sculpture. Uh, a, a sculpture on an enormous scale that we I now mean, know as the Great to, Sphinx. To, to look at it, and it's obvious that the head was carved and afterwards because it's much smaller. But and, and the ancient Egyptians were masters of proportion. Yes, if they'd they had were. a choice, uh, they would not have done that. But no. they didn't have a choice. They had this very damaged head. And they um, did something, yeah, whatever they could to... Yeah. Uh, um, but what they couldn't do is change the orientation of the Sphinx. Yeah. And it will always gaze at the rising sun and, and at I dawn on the spring equinox. M- my wife and I have been there many times at dawn on the spring equinox. And you can oh, see that the Great course. Sphinx looks directly at the rising sun at that day. You go there on the summer solstice, it's many degrees to the north of east. Uh-huh. You go there on the winter solstice, it's many degrees to the south of but east. The We've been there at every occasion, but at the equinox, perfectly looks at the rising sun and therefore looks at the constellation that houses the sun Mm -hmm. and that speaks to the age of leo that Mm -hmm. speaks to twelve thousand plus years ago right um and and now i want to get to this um under 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 his paw like there's this cavity um and the government never authorized any research for that i'm uh, I'm aware yeah i kind of avoid conspiracy theories i know you do (coughs) but Listen, being, there are conspiracies there are in conspiracies. the world. Yeah. <laughs> there, 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 there are conspiracies. Yeah. Um, Robert Schock and his team did uh, seismic work, quite simple seismic work where you use a hammer and bash it on the ground and see how the, the sound waves reflect mm-hmm. under the surface of the, of, of the bedrock. Yep. And what those sound waves showed was a, a large, regular-shaped chamber about 20 or 30 feet under the great the, the, the left forepaw of the Great Sphinx. And that was like 20 years ago, 30 years Oh, that years was 1992. Ago. So the technology we have nowadays would be much we could do We could accurate. do much more. But we, we don't. Well, oddly enough, the, the two leading Egyptologists, the leading Egyptian Egyptologist, Dr. Zahi Hawass, and the leading American Egyptologist, Dr. Mark Lehner, have been involved in drilling around the Sphinx. And they claim that that drilling has been <coughs> entirely to clear groundwater from beneath the Sphinx. Uh, but it's very odd that their drills went in very, very close to the place where that, where that chamber that is. That drives me insane. Like, I get really, really mad. Me too, because this, this is a matter that could be put to rest relatively easily. If there were openness, if, if there were transparency, if there were no secrets, yeah. it would be possible to do ground-penetrating radar. It would be possible to do seismic tomography with the latest equipment and, we, and to we absolutely have... settle it, whether there's a large chamber under the Sphinx or not. Instead, Egyptology has chosen simply not to talk about this. Not to talk about it, but I'm pretty sure they did do something about it. But they keep... I when can't you were... help having that feeling. Well, of course, that's how the, the world... Uh, you were talking about secret societies and the, the knowledge has been passed to a very tiny elite throughout the years. Um, and... And I understand that some... And there's another odd thing, which, I've, which I've, I've mentioned before, and I'll mention it again, is, is that both Mark Lehner and Zahi Hawass uh, received their college education courtesy of the Edgar Cayce Foundation. What? <laughs> Robert and I documented it at length in our book, uh, Keeper of Genesis, wait, which is called wait, The Message of the Sphinx possible? in America. Wait, how is that even possible? Well, it, it is possible because the Edgar Cayce Foundation, because of Edgar Cayce's statements was very interested in the Sphinx. Yeah, very much. And what they did was they found two young men uh, who were working around the Sphinx. Zahi Hawass, then not not Dr. Zahi Hawass, was a simple inspector on the Giza Plateau. uh, And they found the funding to send him through uh, university. Uh, what does that mean? I, I'm not sure what it means. <laughs> I'm just stating a fact. Let's speculate. And they and and the same and the same goes with with Mark Lehner, uh, who who was also sent through university by the Edgar Casey Foundation. Um, and, and since then, both of them have completely distanced themselves from the Edgar Casey Foundation. Oh, okay. Now you have to you have to wonder how 
sincere that distancing is. Zahi Hawass, until very recently, was still giving lectures to the Edgar Casey Foundation, even though he claims to detest the whole notion of Atlantis. Um, you well, just have to wonder. I can't help I'm wondering. I'm confused here. I'm very confused. I'm, I'm, I'm confused too. I don't understand because I feel like Edgar Casey is the one that brought this myth to life in the last century. Yeah. Um, I read a lot of his books. Well, not his personal books, yeah. but a lot of his readings. And, and and he kept saying that we would discover this chamber. And I, I feel like betrayed or very disappointed that it's not coming. And if we did discover it, I feel even more frustrated that we don't share this knowledge with the whole humanity. Yeah. I feel like this belongs to me and you and everyone. And if it, it does, changes, this whole, this whole mess needs to be unraveled. And it is a mess at the moment. There are so many conflicting interests involved in it. There's the interests of mainstream archaeology, which both Zahi Hawass and Mark Lena claim to represent and do represent. They are fully accredited Egyptologists now. But they work for the government, do they? Well, no. Mark, Mark Lena work, works for the University of Chicago. Oh, okay. And, and Zahi Hawass was the chief inspector of antiquities on, on the Giza Plateau. He became a minister, minister of culture briefly. Yeah, okay. He's the one I thought. Yeah. Um, you, you know, they're, He's they're very bro- high place in the government. Very though. highly placed. Well, close to- there were some scandals surrounding his name, and he... he faced a, con- a criminal charge, uh, which was then dropped. Okay. Um, and he no longer he no longer has a high government position. Okay. But he's still the Egyptologist but to I whom want, the government refers. But I don't want this refers. guy to be in charge of the biggest discovery of the last century. Well, no, no, century. no, no, no do I. <laughs> I, don't, I don't feel okay with that. And why then is it un- unraveling this way? And, you know, I heard you say uh, in an interview, you felt like, that there was sort of a, uh, a shift, like we need to know, and there is something at work in the world that makes us. I, I, I listen. You said it way better than I than I do, but and I feel the opposite. Like I feel the, throughout our history, the known history of human humanity, we for, forget. Like when you say in your book, the conquistadors when they got in America, they destroyed everything, yeah. and the Alexandria Library. And, you know, it's happened so often in yeah. our past that we destroyed yes. our knowledge, we d- we destroy our, past. our We destroy our own past uh, yeah. all, all the time. The, so, the, and the, I the, feel The destruction hurt. of the Mayan codices in Central it's America. It's like in our DNA. You know, it, 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 we, we deliberately destroy our own memory. Everything. It's, a very, it's a very peculiar phenomenon. There's like a phenomenon. handful left of everything that was there, yeah. and it would have changed everything. Mm. Um, but the plain fact of the matter is that the Sphinx issue could be relatively easily solved with, with modern technology. So is why there don't or we is do there it? not a chamber beneath the Great Sphinx? Uh, Robert Schock's seismic work back in 1992 says, yes, there is a chamber okay, beneath but we are the Great Sphinx. Now we, 31 years we, later. We've got much better technology today, and it could be relatively easily solved, but nobody is solving it. And I wonder why, and then I look at the connection, the very definite connection between Zahi Hawass and the Edgar Casey organization between Mark Lehner and the Edgar Casey organization. These are the two most powerful archaeologists working around the Great Sphinx. And I can't help wondering whether there's something going on that we're not being told about. Well, we were, I don't I, claim that's a fact. I'm just of puzzled. Of course, we're by wondering it. because I would I would think that Edgar Casey would have uh, the foundation would have funded anything that would have proven. That uh, I I, 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 su- the, I suspect that they did uh, to some extent. But then we have to ask ourselves: When do they want this information to be released? Is there is there a particular moment? Uh, well, is, I guess it's just very inconvenient for them because Casey it, it, made some some statements about, uh, and I don't remember the exact details about about when this information would return to the world. And oh, it, it, maybe didn't. there's an agenda at work here. Maybe in five or ten or fifteen years, the truth will out. Um, I thought I I never thought at this age I am right now that we wouldn't know. Like mm-hmm. I feel like. I expected that to happen before, so uh, I'm, I'm, I'm yes, disappointed. Yes, I, I, I mis- expect it to happen as well. There's and, so much and, and, and if in you're, our world. If you're drilling around the Great, Swing, uh, Great Sphinx, uh, identifying groundwater and drawing up groundwater from under the Sphinx, you're already there. You have yeah. everything you need yeah. uh, to, to put this matter to rest and either say, yeah, definitely there's no chamber, or yes, definitely there is a chamber. I think we're past this question. It's like, what's in there? Uh, yeah, that, well, that's the, that's the next <laughs> That's thing. the big question. Question. Uh, or, or indeed, if there is anything in there, has it been already removed? You know? And that's where I get anxious. Yeah. I don't even want to think about it. Yeah. 
they, there's they too much secrecy everything. and yeah. it's unnecessary this is a global human heritage yes it's in ancient egypt yes it belongs first and foremost to the egyptian people but it belongs to it everyone. is a global heresy yeah. a, a global legacy it I belongs know. to everybody in the world we we all have the same need to know the truth Where about our past and, and the great sphinx is a very important structure in mm-hmm. connection with that yeah and resolving this issue would be relatively straightforward and it's a puzzle to me and as I say, I don't like conspiracy theories, but I, I have to feel there's some kind of conspiracy yes. going on. We uh, know when we're being lied to. Either a conspiracy of ignorance. Yeah. We're just so locked in a particular framework that we don't want to know. Yeah. Or, or some sort of deliberate project. Well, and that's why I think also it creates a lot of skepticism because we see that we are being deceived or lied to or just uh, kept in the dark on so many topics. Yeah. There's a great deal of distrust now. And this is, this is mm-hmm. a healthy thing uh, that humans, humans have begun to distrust our governments. Mm-hmm. We, we, don't, we don't trust them. And then we go back to the 1950s and by and large, people did trust their governments. That's changed. Mm-hmm. And it's changed because of facts, because mm-hmm. we've all learned that our governments lie to us that they mislead us, that they tell that they... 90% of pe- people in Quebec got vaccinated. So I guess they still do trust the government a lot. But yeah, yeah. yeah. so, but there was a lot of fear factor and that's... I what, I've, what I've seen happening gradually over the last 20 years is a growing distrust of authority. Right. And I regard that as a very healthy project, process. Yeah. It's not complete yet. Authority is still very much in control and and um, very much in control of central narratives mm-hmm. about what human beings are and what we're here to do. The central mm-hmm. narrative of, of Western technological culture is that human beings are primarily here to produce and to consume. Mm-hmm. Uh, and really everything else is uh, secondary. Yeah. <laughs> the religious powers say that we're primarily here to serve God. But both the religious powers and the secular powers are imposing a narrative mm-hmm. on, on the population. And gradually, bit by bit, people are fighting back. Have you always been them. an um, anarchist and at heart? Well, let's look at the word anarchy. Mm-hmm. It, it means mm-hmm. literally without government. Exactly. And, and yeah. uh, yes, I, I would regard myself as an anarchist. Mm-hmm. I don't think that governments are yeah. nearly as necessary mm-hmm. as they claim to be. Yeah, I, I, I think so. there is a case in large, complicated societies for some sort of administration to be mm-hmm. involved. Um, but governments which tell us what to do, which tell us what to think, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. which tell us what's important and what's not important and expect us to buy into that, they're the cause of most of the troubles in the world today. I would say the big governments, big centralized governments, and the big centralized religions, and the big centralized corporations, these are the three branches of most of the horror and evil that takes place in the world today. Yeah. Uh, and they, they look after their own interests. Of course. And they pretend that they're doing so in our interests. Agree to good. It doesn't feel like it. We need to see, we need to see through that. And it's just, mm-hmm. it's just a question whether, whether that structure will be dismantled in time before it actually destroys the human race uh, completely. I think something will happen before. I think a lot of people are waking up. The more <laughs> the more they are um, controlling us and smothering us, the more we need air, we need air and then yeah. we we break free from this. I yeah. really believe you know, I talk I talk about the covid because I've had a lot of people writing to me, people who are following me, who wrote to me to say it felt good to see during the pandemic that some people were you know, a counter narrative like I was, but also a lot of people said it was so intense what happened, what we witnessed, like having a hot dog to get a shot or people were like, so, lots of people woke woke up. Yeah, Lo- yeah. Lots of people said this, this was not about health anymore. Yeah. Why would I get a hot dog? I mean, it's not even healthy food. <laughs> so if it's really you about mean health. You people were being rewarded with a hot dog well, if they had the yes. shot? Yes. <laughs> yes. That's what we How had that in Quebec. <laughs> yeah. Yes. And they were trying to get the, the youth to go. And so they would have this incentive, yeah. very stupid incentive. Um, and in the States, they were even yeah. more stupid than that. Well, consider the other thing, um, which is if you wanted to travel. Uh, Most during, people got jabbed before. If you because, wanted to travel that, during the COVID period, you, needed that. you had to have a shot. It was it was literally impossible well, you just don't to go from one country to another. Well, some of us have to. Oh travel yeah, I know, for I know, work, I get it. Know? I I do. Tra- I, that's why I say that we do travel shows, my husband and I. But we had babies, so it was easy to say we were not going to go anywhere. Yeah. Um, but yeah. Anyway, then that's another. There were topic, there were but. there was was a whole system. Part of it was propaganda, and part of it was structure, like the fact that you can't 
travel for your work unless yeah. you have a shot. Yeah. Um, which which forced people into accepting what the government said. And and you mentioned that was for work, like I guess in your case and other people. But I know a lot of people who had to get jabbed to keep their job. Oh yeah. So mm -hmm. it was a lot of um, pressure. A lot of pressure. A great a great deal. So of I don't. Pressure. I wouldn't say. And, and that's that. That's why I think you need to question. I I, I feel like I want to live in a. I have babies, two babies now, and and I want them to live in a world where they are free to think for themselves and choose what's good for their own body according yeah. to how they feel. Like just ground yourself, meditate. Um, mm. they're, we're not taught to do that, but mm. I, I do believe that if you are centered enough, you can take a good decision for yourself I, I and do, it, it will be in harmony with the rest of the yeah. community. Yeah. It shouldn't go against the community. If you think about yourself, it's not selfish to choose something that is good and right for you. If it comes from the right place, no. That's, 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 that's how right. I if feel it comes about in the right place. I, 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 I personally think we should be free to do anything we want as long as we don't do harm to others. Exactly. <coughs> that's, <But> <coughs> that's my basics. And, and, and I've come to that actually through the whole issue of the war on drugs, uh, which is another area of central government control that is totally unnecessary and which is only about encouraging the habit of obedience. Yeah. Like uh, a lot of things. There, there's no doubt that the war, the so-called war on drugs, has been a complete and utter failure. Uh, mm -hmm. It has created enormous criminal enterprises, mm -hmm. um, and it has resulted, in some countries, in in people suffering the death sentence for smoking dope. You know, I, I mean, this is insane. What? It's utterly, it's utterly insane. Not in England. No, not in England. Yeah. You just go to prison there. Yeah. Uh, you know, they fuck up your life in some other way. Is it legal now in uh, no, weed? No? no, not in Britain. Okay. Um, they, they, they've recently introduced a, a kind of medical marijuana thing, but it's hardly available to anybody. It's okay, quite, quite so difficult to, I guess in Canada we're... Quite more difficult more to access. Things. Um, I, I just think that the, one of the places that governments should stay out of is people's heads. They don't belong Absolutely. there. Absolutely. Uh, and, and as long as we follow that, that golden rule, that we don't do harm to others. Mm -hmm. I mean, how can, how can a person smoking marijuana or taking a cannabis edible, how can they possibly be harming others? Yeah. You know, that's a personal private decision. Mm -hmm. The moment they do harm others, we already have laws mm -hmm. that govern doing harm to others. We don't need laws that patrol the inner sanctum of our own consciousness. Mm -hmm. and, and if we accept and tolerate such laws, then we're accepting and tolerating government interference in every single aspect of our lives. Yeah, it opens the door for that. It completely opens the door to it. And, yeah. and, it, and it makes it, and it makes it acceptable mm -hmm. in many people's minds the, yeah the propaganda around the war on drugs is just full of lies mm. you know you can still encounter people today who believe that you know one joint and is going to lead to your ruin of your life well the only way it's going to lead to the ruin of your life is if the police catch you smoking it yeah oh and, yeah and g inflict a criminal sentence upon you yeah which is well, the case in many many countries i'm 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 glad that canada has legalized cannabis it's a good way however, to control they, they are however The fact is that that's also come from central government. Yeah. Um, one of the things I like about America is that the legalization of cannabis has happened from popular initiative state by state. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's been something that people have taken their own power back. Yeah. Not in every state, but in a great many. And, yeah. and in the process of doing so, they've shown that all the lies and myths about cannabis are indeed lies and myths. Yeah. And not truth. Those, those states like, that have legalized cannabis have not fallen to pieces. Yeah. You know? No one's. Yeah, exactly. I think it's the same with the psychedelics in general. Um, they should be legal because of course first, they, they be don't legal. really create addiction and yeah. it's a tool to you can use it as a tool to of evolve they should be as legal. a human and, and we're, we're, we're you know we're seeing a, a gradual process where, yeah. this, where this is happening but there's been a lot of decades of propaganda against it so yes, there's a has, lot to yeah. undo yeah. and i would i would wrap up with with this i think it's um you seem to be like a spiritual person and the word spiritual maybe doesn't mean the same to you than to me but um obviously you are in a journey Uh, with ayahuasca and yes. trying to get rid of stuff you were talking about your migraines well I, i've come to realize that we're not we cannot be reduced to matter mm -hmm. there, there is much more uh, complexity to the human condition than just our bodies our digestive systems yeah. you know our skin our fingernails yeah, it, our hair there's more we're, to that the, the stuff you can weigh and measure and count 
is in many ways the least important aspect of the human being. It's the stuff you can't weigh and measure and count mm -hmm. that is that is more important. Is mm -hmm. that is is that person a kind person? Do they do they do they care for others? Mm -hmm. Are they are they exploring the mystery of being alive? Mm -hmm. We're persuaded to think that there's no mystery in being alive, that it's just an accident of chemistry and biology. Yeah. To me, the fact of being alive is a, is a huge mystery. That sounds We, very disconnected to think that way, but it feels like nowadays science is so important that if you if you do believe there is some, something after life, if you believe in reincarnation, if you believe in anything that we can't really prove, yeah. you're a psycho. Like, yeah, you're it, regarded as a complete lunatic. Exactly. <laughs> and, and But it, my experiences have, have led me to believe in, uh, in, I think reincarnation is very likely. Very I think it's likely. very probable. Yeah. Uh, and I think the ancient Egyptians had it, had it, had it right that we're given a, an incredible opportunity to be born in a human body. Mm. And, and what we must do fundamentally is live up to that opportunity not waste that gift mm -hmm. and our governments and our large corporations and i'm sorry to say our large religions mm -hmm. are all teaching us to waste that gift to mm -hmm. limit our inquiry to limit our relationship to the world mm -hmm. within very narrow boundaries that are defined defined by those large entities mm -hmm. instead of defining our own boundaries which mm -hmm. is what we should which is what we should be doing is this um Is this your mission, you think, in life? Is this how you see the, um, your future? Still trying to figure out um, deeper and deeper within you? Um, I, I suppose so, in a, in a way. Um, I, 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 regard, I regard my mission in life as asking fundamental questions about the stories we're told about ourselves. Mm -hmm. uh, not just calmly accepting everything that the government says yeah. or that archaeology says, yeah. but questioning that and questioning mm -hmm. it deeply and doing so in a rational, reasonable way yeah. uh, based, on, based on evidence, not just upon fancy. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, think it's I think it's important to do that and mm -hmm. I intend to continue doing that uh, to the end of my days. Um, Thanks for doing it. <laughs> I think we're a lot, uh, we feel very lucky we have you. <laughs> well, it's, kind of, it's kind of you to say that. I, I, I also feel lucky to be alive. Mm. And uh, I'm grateful to my, to my readers who've mm -hmm. given me the opportunity to explore the world mm -hmm. and, and to come to my own conclusions about it. Mm -hmm. um, and and um, this is why it, it so offends me when, when archaeologists and their media friends <coughs> suggest that I'm some sort of fraud or hoaxer or liar. I put my life on the line mm -hmm. in this investigation for more than 30 years, mm -hmm. you know, seven years of scuba diving in the most in the most difficult conditions all around the world to show that imagine. there are structures that were submerged yeah. at the end of the ice age. The the explorations that I've done with with psychedelics have often been have often been risky and in risky places in in certain ways. Mm -hmm. um, but I felt it's right to do that. Yeah. Um, I, I don't just want to sit back in an armchair and, mm -hmm. and uh, theorize. I, yeah. want, I want to put my boots on the ground and, yeah. and uh, explore. Yeah, and that's the fun part. Yeah. <laughs> well, thanks for your time. It was a very interesting conversation. Good. Thank thanks. you.